Provench is an established cellular immunotherapy used to treat certain men with advanced prostate cancer. Provenge is customized to each individual and is made from his own immune cells. Immunotherapy is the prevention or treatment of disease with substances that may stimulate an immune response. The immune system has memory and can recognize substances it has encountered previously. Immunotherapy is designed to boost the immune system to target and attack advanced prostate cancer. This is why immunotherapy empowers the immune system to fight the cancer immediately and allow the effects to last over time. Indication. Provenge is a prescription medication used to treat certain men with advanced prostate cancer. Provenge is an established cellular immunotherapy and is customized to each individual by using his own immune cells. Important safety information. Before receiving Provenge, tell your doctor about any medical conditions, including heart or lung problems, or if you have had a stroke. Tell your doctor about any medicines you take, including prescription and non-prescription drugs, vitamins, or dietary supplements. The most common side effects of Provenge include chills, fatigue, fever, back pain, nausea, joint ache, and headache. These are not all the possible side effects of Provenge treatment. Provenge is made from your own immune cells, which are collected during a process called leukapheresis. The cells are processed, returned, and then infused back into the patient through an IV, intravenous infusion, approximately three days later. This process is completed in three cycles, about two weeks apart. Each infusion takes approximately one hour and requires 30 minutes of post-infusion monitoring. Provenge infusion can cause serious reactions. Tell your doctor right away if you have signs of a heart attack or lung problems, such as trouble breathing, chest pains, racing or irregular heartbeats, high or low blood pressure, dizziness, fainting, nausea or vomiting, have signs of a stroke, such as numbness or weakness on one side of the body, decreased vision in one eye or difficulty speaking, develop symptoms of thrombosis, which may include pain and or swelling of an arm or leg with warmth over the affected area, discoloration of an arm or leg, shortness of breath, chest pain that worsens on deep breathing, have signs of infection such as fever over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, redness or pain at the infusion or collection sites. Tell your doctor about any side effects that concerns you or does not go away. For more information, talk with your doctor. You are encouraged to report negative side effects of prescription drugs to the FDA. Visit www.fda.gov slash medwatch or call 1-800-FDA-1088. Please see accompanying full prescribing information. Prostate Cancer Research Institute is an educational organization for prostate cancer patients, their caregivers, and their families. We put patients first and are an unbiased source of information and support. For over 20 years, our goal has been to meet the educational needs of prostate cancer patients at every stage of their journey. Medical technology is advancing rapidly and new treatments are becoming available. Patients have to make complex choices which have lasting implications. They face unexpected industry biases and doctors who may not be up to date on the latest research. Your donation helps men receive the latest, most up-to-date information, which empowers them to make informed decisions. Our website, PCRI.org, is a wealth of information and resources. Our conferences and webinars are a way to get patients questions answered by leading physicians and researchers. And we have a helpline for men to call with questions about their diagnosis, treatment choices, and side effects associated with these treatments. Each week we produce multiple videos covering concepts and every patient question that we can think of about the disease in a straightforward and easy to understand format. This was a brief overview of what we do at PCRI, and to learn more you can visit our website. Your donation directly funds our educational programs, which give life-changing information to men during a very vulnerable time in their life, and we thank you for your consideration. 
You can visit PCRI.org to learn more.
Hey everyone, it's Alex from the PCRI and welcome to our first ever virtual men's health fair. The PCRI and our team, we came up with this event about six weeks ago and thanks to our incredible moderator, Dr. Mark Moyad, we were able to pull some incredible speakers and I think you're going to find this extremely educational for your overall health. Today we're going to be discussing all sorts of topics from weight, new weight loss drugs that have come out, osteoporosis, bone health, cardiovascular disease, and so much more, so stay tuned. If you would like more resources on men's health, please visit our website, pcri.org. The link will be in the description below this video, and you can find a checklist to help you screen for all sorts of things on your general health, as well as a weight training protocol that we encourage men to do, especially when it comes to prostate cancer. It's good to build up those muscles and stay strong. Today, you're going to hear a presentation from Dr. Mark Moyad and Dr. Marty Miner. So they're going to be discussing new developments in weight loss drugs, osteoporosis, sexual health, and so much more. Dr. Marty Miner is with the Men's Health Center in Rhode Island. He's not only the founder, but the co-director, and he's an absolute expert in sexual health. I trust that you'll find this educational. Welcome to the first annual Moyed Souls PCRI. PCRI, meant, we have no official name for this. So I'm going to make up an, some kind of official name. PCRI Annual Men's Health Event. You wanted it and you got it, Toyota, as we say. I think I just made that up. But the reality is we have the fall conference, the massive conference, the first uh, weekend after the Monday of Labor Day, we have the last weekend of March, the spring conference. And because of the demand for more and more material, we decided at the ninth hour, actually uh, Alex Scholz decided the ninth hour to do a men's health conference. And then we agreed because we listened to everything that she says in general. And they said, who do you want as your first guest besides Grant Hill, besides this incredible athlete? I said, I want someone that has virtually no athletic skills, but they are incredibly smart as a physician. And everybody looks up to this doctor. And this doctor's name is synonymous with men's health. And I don't know if I can get him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work my friendship zone here and make him feel guilty. But I want <laughs> Marty Minor. I want Marty Minor, MD. He has the same initials as me, M and M. He is co-director of the Men's Health Center, but that's not even fair. He has a lot of different roles at Brown University, but he's also a professor, not only in family practice, but also in urology. What people don't realize about him, besides the fact that he's been in practice for 35 years, 20 years in sexual medicine, long ago, he started the first, and I always say it legit, the first legitimate men's health center at a major university or academic center. So Marty Minor, people look to him all around the world and in all sorts of ways on doing, on creating a men's health center, comprehensive men's health care, and how do you do that uh, with integrity, morality, and ethics? And that's Marty Minor. And so I've known him for about two decades. And so I begged and pleaded and he said, I'm gonna come give a talk and then we're gonna do some Q and A. So Marty, I could go on about eight more years with your CV. I will not, instead I want you to give your uh, presentation then we'll do the Q and A. But I just wanna say how grateful I am that you are here. Namaste, thank you so much for joining us in the first annual Men's Health Conference, which will be one of many. There you are, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Um, I have to say that Mark is a very special human being who has written more, more books on Amazon than I think of any <laughs> mystery or fiction writer. Some people say he does do fiction, but most of the time it's about preventative medicine and lifestyle medicine. And in men's health, there is no one who is his equal. So the question is, and I get this all the time in the Men's Health Center, I am a family practitioner. I practice family medicine for 20 years, but more of the conversation came to me about male sexual function and men who were concerned about their ability to develop, keep, and um, sustain erections 
And this was before the, the, uh, the availability of Viagra. And I was very concerned that this symptom of erectile dysfunction and inability to fill the penis was somehow related to an increase in overall male mortality. That those men who came to me with um, erectile dysfunction had a greater incidence or a greater risk of dying of a heart attack or stroke. And I wanted to make sure that I um, investigated them or did a workup to potentially prevent another heart related or, or neurologic related death. So the question is, why do men die earlier? And is it because they're risk taking? Is it because they smoke? Is it because they do dangerous professions? It's probably, to be honest, all of the above. These are my disclosures. I work for a couple pharmaceutical companies uh, as a consultant and investigator, and I've been on multiple American Urologic Association um, guideline memberships panels where we've developed guidelines for erectile dysfunction, testosterone deficiency, and Peyronie's disease, and now prostate cancer. But the gender differences and mortality and life expectancy vary throughout the world. Um, Yet in most countries, men live shorter lives than women. In Russia, that difference is, as you can see, 13 years. In the US, it is five years. And this is an advertisement that somehow spoke to me, but it's a place for mom. And you see this advertisement all the time on television. However, there's never a place for dad because all of the dads or grandfathers are dead by this age, and it's just women. And there are companies and efforts to try to care for those individuals. But what's behind this male-female gap in life expectancy? Is it unhealthy behaviors, higher smoking, heavy drinking, gun use, employment and hazardous occupations, risk-taking, um, higher rates of lung cancer, accidents, and homicide. Again, all of the above. Genetic factors aside, men, um, what can we do to help men live longer? And that's to seek medical care earlier. Um, one out of four men do not have um, an established relationship with a primary doctor. Um, modify risk factors for heart disease, reduce smoking, lose weight, modify risk behaviors, screen and treat depression, and pay attention to early family history for, for signals of what's to come. And of course, what Mark Moyad always professes, which is diet, exercise, and prevention of type 2 diabetes. So let's look at specifically obesity and the cardio potential cardioprotective effects of treating erectile dysfunction, treating testosterone deficiency, and uh, recognizing these in practice. I'm first going to talk about a case, and this is um, this case is about. TD. He is a 50-year-old male man who I just saw recently, father of two adolescent children, boy and a girl, 16 and 15. He provides in-house counsel to a large corporate finance firm in downtown Boston. It's very stressful. He's working 60 hours a week, but it's less stressful than his prior life, which is prosecutorial work. His wife is also a corporate attorney. He's noted a two-year history of progressive intrusive fatigue. He fatigues more easily. He's distracted. He finds himself napping during the day because he's working from home. Um, 
He pre it prevents physical activity. He no longer wants to get in the gym twice a week and do his martial arts. His libido is gone. He finally, at his wife's urging, started seeing a psychotherapist. And he was shortly, about three months ago, he was started on antidepressant therapy um, and, and serotonin, um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor like Zoloft or Prozac. And he was also given another medication, bupropion, because it helps to potentially um, negate the effects that these medicines have on male sexual function. What these medicines do that are so typically prescribed by primary care doctors is that they cause erectile dysfunction and they um, prevent libido. So he was anxious and depressed. He was really fearful of what was going on in the, in the world politically and the war. Um, he's gained 30 pounds during COVID. And his past medical history was positive for high blood pressure. That's the only med that he's on. And elevated lipids, but he's not receiving any treatment. He was found as part of his fatigue workup to have obstructive sleep apnea, which prevents him, um, which stops his breathing at night. It's He's snoring loudly, and then he'll stop breathing for a short period of time. He did this several times through the night. It was recorded, and now he's awaiting CPAP therapy. However, because of CPAP is a, par, a positive pressure system forcing um, oxygenated air into the lungs to keep him breathing at night. Many men and women use CPAP, but because of the difficulties with uh, production, he's been awaiting a device for CPAP for nine months. Um, his meds include a medication for blood pressure called Losartan, which is a very good medicine. It's um, it prevents, um, it's not associated, one of the few blood pressure medicines that are not associated with male in, in, increased male sexual dysfunction. He's also placed on amlodipine. Oftentimes you need two medicines to adequately control male blood pressure, oftentimes three. He was given propranolol, which is an old medicine which slows the heart and is used more frequently these days for anxiety in low doses. And he was this medication called um, ezetivalopram, which is he's using for his generalized anxiety and depression. You can see that his vital signs reflect that his blood pressure is elevated. 148 over 91 is high. It should be below 120 over 80. His pulse is 84. That's a little bit rapid, but he's. this is the first time in his office. His height is 5 feet 11 inches. He weighs 268 pounds. But what's most significant is most of this weight is called visceral adiposity, meaning that his waist circumference, which is taken at the belly button, it's 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 a waist a tape measure that's taken around the belly button. It's forty six inches. It should be less than forty inches. So most of his weight is in his belly, and his body mass index is thirty seven. He is considered morbidly obese with marked visceral adiposity. His labs reveal that his total testosterone is 160. His um, re repeat testosterone, total testosterone was three, 204. So what that means, his normal male levels of testosterone range between 300 and 1,000. This man's testosterone was below 200 on one occasion and just 204 in another. And he has signs and symptoms of low testosterone or what we call testosterone deficiency. The luteinizing hormone, which is, is measured, is sent from the pituitary gland deep in the brain to the testes to stimulate the release of testosterone. His LH is 4.6, which means that he is making 
luteinizing hormone and stimulating the testes. However, the testes are not responding because the um, of this visceral adiposity, this belly fat. It's causing a lot of inflammation and decreasing the release of his testosterone. What's very important here is his A1C. His A1C is reflective of his last 12 weeks of glycemic or glucose control. It is elevated. A normal A1C goes to 5.7. His is 6.1. We use an A1C to make a diagnosis of diabetes. This man has pre-diabetes. His A1C would be 6.5 on two occasions for him to have a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, but he's already halfway there. What's important is because of his belly fat, his obesity, he's 50 and he's already pre-diabetic and likely to become diabetic. He has low testosterone and his um, total cholesterol is 226, which is above 180, the desired goal. And his HDL cholesterol, which is his good cholesterol, is under 40, which is 38, and that also puts him at risk. His LDL cholesterol is above 100, which is the desired goal at this time. It's 155, that's his bad cholesterol. And his risk ratio of total cholesterol to HDL cholesterol is 5.9, greater than four, so he's at risk of a cardiovascular event. So this man needs to lose weight, he needs to begin exercise. He needs to continue the medication that's helping his anxiety, but he needs to get his body in shape. And he's here to see me because his primary complaint was that he had no sexual desire. He had no sexual desire. His testosterone deficiency is manifested or, or supported by the following symptoms. Low sexual desire, a erectile dysfunction, he cannot sustain erections, and loss of spontaneous erections, and a difficulty in arousing. It takes him longer to become, um, to, to become aroused when stimulated, and it takes him, um, he has an inability to keep his erections. So he came to me with these issues, but you can see that his life is characterized by a stressful job, poor sleep, the presence of high blood pressure, obstructive sleep apnea, elevated bad cholesterol, low good cholesterol, low testosterone levels, and um, um, hypertension. So manifested uh, in the in his two presenting signs and symptoms, which is low sexual desire and an inability to maintain an erection. So we're not gonna talk about treatment of this man, but I, I can see that this would be a really fascinating topic to talk about whether you use testosterone, how long you use testosterone, um, for what period of time, what are the safest forms of testosterone therapy? How do you monitor an individual during testosterone therapy? Um, why use it? Um, I think that would be good for another discussion. What I wanted to talk about today was obesity. That man was severely obese, yet that man is I see 24 to 28 men a day. And that man is one of the 20 similar patterns that I see day in and day out. The prevalence of obesity in the US is, um, is overall 40%, 40% of adults. And what's most striking and most fearful is that by 2030, we're gonna see that prevalence increase to 60% in this Southern belt. We're gonna see that prevalence close to 50% throughout the country. There are very few spots, if all, at all, where the prevalence of obesity 
will be less than 20%. We defined obesity by a, a body mass index of greater than 30. You can see that gentleman that I talked about before had a BMI of 37, but obesity is present far below that. And why is it important? It's important, as you can see, it has numerous concomitant comorbid medical conditions, elevated blood pressure, elevated LDL cholesterol or low density um, lipoprotein cholesterol, a lowering or a decrease of HDL cholesterol, poor quality of life, sleep apnea, type two diabetes, stroke and heart attack and death. This slide is important because with the benefits of five to 10% of weight loss, in that man alone, 10% would bring him down to 250 pounds. He would still be significantly obese, but that 10% would improve his, his reduction of his type 2 diabetes, a reduction of his heart mortality, an improvement of his lipids, improvement of blood pressure, improvement of his sleep, and improvement of every quality of life aspect that he would experience. Not only is that man at significant emotional distress, that man is at significant um, heart risk. He is the father of two adolescent children, and he's at significant risk of sudden death from a heart attack. There's a psychological burden of obesity that includes eating disorders, anxiety, depression, quality of life and body image, stigma, discrimination and self-esteem. Um, that man feels guilty about his weight. He feels that he's too, he's too sluggish. He feels that it's because of his behavior. And the truth is that he's eating more because he's anxious and he's eating at irregular times and he's eating at night when other people are sleeping, because that's when he's most anxious, but he's not eating out of hunger. If he tries to go on a diet, and this man has dieted all his life, he will lose weight for a short period of time. He'll get to the gym on a regular basis, but then he feels hungry. If he doesn't eat, if he doesn't start to restrict carbohydrates, this man feels hunger and he craves carbohydrates because that's what's the primary portion of his, his intake. So the use of testosterone, and I put this one slide in here because there are people who believe that testosterone um, repletion, and you see these T centers, which qualify or call themselves men's health centers throughout the country these for-profit testosterone centers. And what we can see from the development of these centers and men's willingness to use hormone therapy just for um, improving overall quality of life is um, driving the sales of testosterone even with some of the concerning studies that were published in 2013 and 2014, which really do not preclude the use of testosterone, but were concerning because they were associated with an um, increased risk of heart attack and stroke. But it's driving the, the prescribing of testosterone almost fivefold over this 10 year period of time. And it is not the single answer. And urologists or these T centers that use these meds do not understand that these meds also decrease fertility in men and can cause and cause their endogenous production of testosterone to cease from working. And urologists who give men testosterone 25%, this is how much is not known about testosterone therapy. 25% of respondents said they would treat infertility with testosterone when in truth, testosterone causes an infertility or the prevention, the prevention 
of the secretion of testosterone from the anterior pituitary gland to the Leydig cell of the testes, which makes testosterone. The Sertoli cell of the testes makes sperm. So what are the alternatives in this man and other men and men of all age to increase their testosterone? To What are the alternatives to testosterone therapy? Those alternatives include, and I call them natural therapies, diet and exercise, improved glycemic control, weight loss, improved sleep, stress reduction, and varicocele repair. Varicoceles are um, engorged or enlarged veins in the scrotum, and they're often fixed by urologists in the workup of infertility. This is a study that was published to examine weight loss on men and exercise. And one of the things that we're told all the time is that men need to lose weight. And I say this all the time, men need to lose weight. And if they want to increase their testosterone, they have to lose weight and um, increase their exercise. Well, these men were, oh, 44 obese men were um, given an uh, an exercise regimen three times per week for an hour, three times a week, and diet of a s- almost 1,700 calorie diet a day. We saw an improvement of their blood pressure. Their systolic blood pressure dropped um, from 114 to 101, and their testosterone improved by 25 nanograms per deciliter. So if it was 275 before, it went up to 300. That's not a lot. That's not a lot. And the truth is we don't have very good lifestyle studies to show that a good lifestyle um, improves testosterone. But this was um, the European study of the aging male. And this was, um, it's a very large study, longitudinal study, of almost 12 years in, in um, housed in Britain that looked at 3,000 men and assessed changes in weight and testosterone levels, as well as sexual function and exercise and, um, and male symptomatology with testosterone levels. So we learned a lot about aging and about aging men and testosterone levels from this study. This is a study published in 2013. What this study shows is that weight change and testosterone levels are not um, inversely related or, or proportionately related, that it's a sinusoidal curve. And what that says is that the weight change Um, the greater the weight change in men, the higher their testosterone levels will rise. So if these men had lost 15% of their weight, they would raise their testosterone levels by 240 nanograms per deciliter. If they lost Um, A greater than 10% decrease in in weight showed about a 100 nanogram per deciliter increase in testosterone. So the greater the weight loss, the higher the increase in testosterone. I thought this study is one of my favorite studies to raise to men. And sleep, if you look at the issues of obstructive sleep apnea, and sleep deprivation, you see that men with obstructive sleep apnea have a much higher prevalence of testosterone deficiency than men who do not. And the greater the degrees of what we call nocturnal hypoxemia, or what happens as men stop breathing at night as they're trying to sleep, they have an oxygen saturation that drops reflecting a hypoxemia or low blood oxygen. And this predicts a lower testosterone. So men, 12 men who underwent a uvula 
um, palatopharyngealoplasty. It means they review, they removed the back of the hard palate in the in the um, throat, and they took this out to pre reduce the risk of of the tongue interrupt falling back on the trachea and interrupting sleep during in these men who had severe obstructive sleep apneas. So this is not a procedure that's done often. It's not done on most men, but it's done on men who have severe obstructive sleep apnea. So they studied these men and they found that those men who underwent this procedure had almost a hundred milligram a nanogram per deciliter improvement of their testosterone. So when you're talking about levels between 300 and 500 in that low normal range, those normal those levels will increase. And men um, who have the lowest levels of testosterone are at the greatest heart disease risk. We have found a number of studies that show that. Again, a different talk for a different day. But men who have their testosterone normalized also appear to have an improved um, reduction of that cardiovascular disease risk, an improved diabetic control if they're diabetic, and an improved sleep. Sleep deprivation. All the men I see every day, um, and I live this for my first 30 years, 40 years of life, restricting sleep to five hours or less, decreased testosterone levels by 10 to 15%. What's most important is that when sleep is restricted during the first half of the night and permitted for um, later in the nocturnal rhythm, that those men show no significant change in their levels. However, those um, men who underwent a total sleep restriction of five hours a night or less that were found to have significant decreases in serum testosterone. So I think what when Mark and I were talking last summer, the most exciting thing for me to see was the approval of a group of diabetic drugs called GLP-1s or glucagon-like peptide agonist type one. These medications were approved in non-diabetics for weight loss. And this was the first time that drugs of this quality and drugs of this safety were approved for weight loss by the FDA. Each individual's Preset weight is determined by a genetic set point, that person's DNA. It's called a metabolic set point. And this set point is based on a combination of genetic history and personal biology. This, this group of medication that was approved by the FDA in August of, of 2021, GLP ones are hormones made by the body to tell the brain to decrease appetite, to trigger fullness and improve metabolic function. And it's aligned with an individual set point. Um, these medications um, work with the body's natural hormones to reduce this met metabolic set point and over time reduce body weight. Obesity is very complex. These hormones, um, um, are now a couple of these are FDA approved and they're safe and they have been in use since 2005 for type 2 diabetes. This is um, a group of um, this is an example of some of the medicines that are available these days for weight loss. The first is Orlistat. Orlistat is um, a medication that works to bind fat. It can cause diarrhea. Um, it by itself can reduce weight up to 9%. Placebo, as you can see, is very strong and was 4%. 
This is a medication that I've never used for weight loss called naltrexone and bupropion. Naltrexone is a medication that's used in treatment of individuals, of course, who have um, opiate uh, ODs or, um, or abuse. And bupropion is an old medication used for the treatment of, of depression. And this has and shows you the weight loss improvement potentially is about 3.7 to 1.7%. And then a medication called fenteramine and topramate, which is a, a medic. It, these are a group of medicines that have been approved by the FDA for weight loss in the past that use um, what's called sympathomimetics. They increase the metabolic activity in the body. The trouble is they elevate blood pressure and they cause vasoconstriction and they cause tachycardia and increased heart rate. So they're not, um, they're not say completely safe to be given in individuals who are most likely to be obese and have elevations in their blood pressure and weight. And this is a medicine called liraglutide, which is uh, Victoza is the brand name. It is a medication used to treat diabetes mellitus. And this was one of the first studies that showed that liraglutide um, also decreased weight about uh, by about 6% when compared to placebo. But what you see here is that these medications are expensive. They've been approved for diabetes for, like we said, for many years, but the, at this point, they're just beginning to be approved for um, weight, the treatment of obesity. And of course, this barrier of greater than a thousand dollars per month retail cost is the greatest barrier to these medicines today. Um, insurance companies simply don't cover them as of yet that I am aware of. But they increase this endogenous production of GLP-1, a, a hormone that promotes insulin secretion, that decreases glucagon and decreases appetite, slows gastric emptying, creates sit a sense of satiety or fullness. Patients who are increasing their GLP-1s, these medications are given subcutaneously, meaning that they're given by an injection and usually have an auto injector that they put up to the belly and give themselves a shot once a week. Um, patients are slowly increased on their um, the amount of the medication over weeks and these individuals lose weight. Weight loss is independent of the ability to reduce glucose levels. And therefore, these medications don't induce what we have often experienced before with medicines to treat type 2 diabetes, and that's um, low glucose levels or hypoglycemia. And what's most important and most exciting to me is that these medications improve heart outcomes they reduce heart attacks, they reduce stroke, and they reduce kidney disease. These are all the pharmacologic effects of these medications. You can see they in decrease cardiovascular risk, they um, decrease inflammation, they decrease blood pressure, they decrease body weight, they increase insulin secretion, they decrease gastric emptying, and they um, increased liver insulin sensitivity, which is very, very important. These are the step trials. And these are the trials that preceded the um, approval by the FDA in 2021 for this particular medication, which is called semaglutide. Semaglutide is this injection once weekly. Um, and in this group, it's given to individuals with obesity, with um, out type 2 diabetes, in this group with type 2 diabetes, in this group in conjunction to treatment of their um, with um, intensive 
um, behavioral therapy, meaning exercise. And what you find with these medications is that um, men who use these, men and women who use these medications lose up to over 15% in comparison to placebo of 2.4%, over 15% of their body weight with um, up to a year after beginning. And this is individuals with type 2 diabetes because this was a lower dose. These are individuals with intensive behavioral therapy, which means exercise and limiting caloric intake. And you can see up to 18%. And those individuals sustain that weight loss, as you can see, when they reach the maximum amount of the medicine and um, continuing throughout 68 weeks, which is over a year and a half. So semaglutide once weekly um, leads to improvement of type two diabetes or prediabetes, those men normalize. It reduces inflammatory markers as they lose weight it improves their quality of life. And it's found to reduce their incidence of cardiovascular events by up to 14 to 17%, which is very significant. Um, this is the ongoing trial that's studying these, these cardiovascular events because these studies are much longer term. Um, the incidence of heart disease, the incidence of kidney disease, um, these studies, We'll st are still being, um, uh, we're still looking at individuals in these studies um, to, to make, to ensure that they too have those similar cardiovascular benefits that are seen in um, patients with type two diabetes. So what we're trying to do, and I, I uh, the point of this talk today is really that we're trying to establish a center of treatment for men, evaluation and treatment for male sexual dysfunctions, erectile dysfunction, low testosterone. So we're looking at developing a holistic center to reduce the incidence of sleep apnea, of, of fatty liver disease, of arthritis, of a hypertension, of coronary artery disease, of type two diabetes. We're trying to, what we call macrovascular complications, and that's death and the microvascular complications, which include the loss of their, their sexual function, their low testosterone. We're trying to treat that in a way that's holistic, that involves lifestyle, weight reduction, and medication, and medication. So, um, and that includes stress management. Um, the last study I wanted to talk about, because I found this to be really interesting, was published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology this past 2021. It was a Swedish study by Anderson, and it involves, it's a retrospective study. So studies that are known as cross-sectional studies, studies that are, are either looking at data or groups of populations of individuals in the past retrospective or in the future prospective, studies, you can do these large cross-sectional studies and you can find associations, but you cannot say that they're causal. So a lot of the things that come out, um, this medication causes dementia, this medication causes um, um, risk of cancer. All of the, most of these studies are associations meaning they're done in cross-sectional studies, retrospective or prospective studies. And there are, um, there are some studies are of course better than others, but these studies um, can show associations between X and Y, but they can't say that X causes Y. So this was a retrospective study of a large number of Swedish men with who were on these oral therapies, meaning oral Viagra or Cialis, oral therapies for erectile dysfunction, or treat, compared to men who were treated with injections, because that was the way we treated men 
before the release of Viagra in 1997, injections into the penis, and they all had a history of coronary artery disease. So this is a high risk group for recurrent heart attack and stroke and death. The mean follow-up of this study was about six years, and there were 2,261 deaths out of that 16,000 group, 14% in the, um, the PD-5 group, meaning the men who had taken the oral medications, and 26% in the men who had injected medications. So what does this study mean? It meant that the, the men who were taking the oral medications had a lower mortality, um, almost a reduction in 12% in mortality compared to the men who were using the injection therapy. And that was also true for their heart failure, their incidence of re recurrent heart attack um, and um, stroke. So the group, the, those of us in, in the know, those of us who look at this and are interested in this for counseling our patients, believe that these meds like Viagra or Cialis or Levitra, these meds actually um, improve blood flow into the penis and the penis is like a balloon. It's just filled with two vascular poles, two, two strong vascular poles that are very small arterials that dilate five to tenfold, and as they dilate, they fill with blood. So with arousal, there's a release of this nitric oxide gas. These medications dilate. Um, I mean, these, these, these vascular bundles dilate, and men have an erection. And the way that these meds work is that they prevent the degradation or the breakdown of that gas, and thereby improve the ability to fill the penis. So men who take Viagra and Cialis or Levitra, they actually lower their blood pressure, even though they might have more flushed face, they lower their blood pressure because they're vasodilating throughout their body. And these may improve survival by augmenting the lowering of blood pressure because these meds lower blood pressure by a mean of about four to six millimeters of mercury. Um, and frequent sex, men who, if you look at the groups, the men who injected or the men who um, were using these meds may be um, more sexually active and therefore frequent sex qualifies as a physical activity, although it's not, it doesn't count as exercise guys. So don't, don't confuse that. It, it does qualify as physical activity activity, which promotes longevity. And the use of these meds certainly can restore that, and that may restore the benefit. But, um, and we also know that deteriorating general health is associated with a decrease in sexual desire and activity, meaning people, if they're not feeling well, they don't want to make love. And therefore, a higher exposure to these meds may identify, have identified healthier and more sexually active patients. So these are all the issues that came up when you looked at the study, but this study shows that men who take these medicines, and there are several studies now that show that, that men who take these medications may improve their overall mortality, may improve their reduction in heart attacks and strokes. So I thought that was fascinating. So. In conclusion, what I wanted to hit on today was that the male longevity gap is real. It's real, and all you have to do is look at the aging population to see that. Um, it's multifactorial. It's based on genetics and behavioral factors. The principal reason for early male death is cardiovascular disease. One of the manifestations of cardiovascular disease early undetected subclinical disease is that men have erectile dysfunction and um, may or may not have low testosterone. That cardiovascular disease is modifiable, that risk factors can be reduced, 
that obesity is the single most modifiable risk factor for cardiovascular disease and semaglutide, a GLP-1 agonist was recently approved for weight loss in non-diabetics and that it achieves between 15 to 18% weight loss, which is also only attainable with bariatric surgery. And in Dr. Moyad's mind, in my mind, this is a game changer. And it may offer cardioprotective and that oral um, treatment of erectile dysfunction with PD-5 therapy, Cialis, Viagra, um, which is Tadalafil and Sildenafil, may offer uh, cardioprotective effects to diminish heart disease and improve survival in men. And this is our desire in Men's Health Month, which is to improve survival in men. Thank you. And we are back after the great Dr. Marty Miner's lecture on men's health, which I thought was fabulous. Do you know how good your lecture was? I'm gonna tell you something that no one's ever told you in the entire history of your men's health lectures. We've been doing this for so many years and especially the last three years, almost full time with Zoom. This is the only lecture, I'm gonna point my computer down. This is the only lecture that when it start to finish, my dog jumped on my lap and is sitting there. See this? He refuses, <laughs> he refuses to leave my lap. So my dog is a male dog and he has a prostate. So, you know, obviously he thought, he thought that your lecture was so relevant that he still is sitting here listening. I've never had him do that with any other lecture, sit on my lap for the whole lecture. How does that make you feel? He must be concerned about your sexual function. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, what, that's what I worry about. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's a danger to zone. I don't <laughs> you mean he's, he's concerned that I'm so macho? That's probably no, what you mean. I'm that's so, not what I'm I said. I'm so men's health. Okay, you mean the opposite. Yeah. That's okay, Grazi. He didn't mean it. Um, all right. Now we're just going to do some random Q&A. The dog is going to continue to sit in my lap. And I hope you felt good about that lecture because that was perfect. Yeah. And that's exactly, you did make one massive error in the lecture. And I'm going to point it out to the audience. Are you, do you want to know what it is? Yeah. One total wrong fact, miscalculation. In your first slide, you said interview with Mark Moya. That's wrong. What it was supposed to say is interview with my BFF, Mark Moyet, MD, MPH. So you were supposed to not say Mark Moyet. You're supposed to say best friend forever, Mark Moyet. So I that, forgot the, the BFF and the MPH. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a little bit embarrassed for you, but I'll get over it that you didn't mention that. Now, let me tell you what I want to talk about first. Yeah. Because we're going to, I want to get this out of the way because I know People know that when I invite people to these events, they're the best of the best, the best people in the business, and then they get inundated. So the question becomes, we're going to post a number in a way that people can call you in, in terms of and have a consult or go to the clinic. Um, do you do also video consults or is everything happening in person there in Providence, Rhode Island? So do you have latitude to see people by video? I am, also? Yeah, I, I see people virtually. Okay. So, so you're open to that. They mm -hmm. don't have to travel across the country because we have people from everywhere. No, I'm not comfortable. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I just didn't want to get you in an overwhelming situation here. All right. Here is the first thing I want to talk about, which people don't realize that you're sort of the king of here. And a lot of people look to you, AUA, other people. I want to talk about testosterone replacement. Um, but before I talk about testosterone replacement, I want to show you something that I, I did with you. This is, this is kind of one of the points you made. When your BMI goes down, your testosterone goes up, right? This is kind of one of the main points. And you and I have discussed this in the past that people don't realize that testosterone is so sensitive to weight change. And so just a little bit of drop. So how much, can you, can you reiterate that again? How much drop in weight do I need to expect a nice little testosterone pop or increase? 10% um, of your body weight. 10%. 10%. And you tell me that people, oh. you'll, you see it in your clinic numerically as well as, so people feel it too. It's not just subjective numbers. 
All the time. They do. All the time. I mean, to be honest, they're also exercising and they're doing, um, they have a, they're following a low carbohydrate diet. So after the first week of difficulty with that diet and reestablishing a balance, um, and not necessarily a low caloric diet, but a low carb diet, and um, they feel better. So I'm not sure how much of it's related to the increase in testosterone, the increase in the exercise, and the increase and the decrease in the carb intake. Mm. But they're all three key factors, but they all feel pe- uniformly feel better. Uniform. And, and, and what I like about your message is it's just not all about just taking testosterone. You can actually make your own testosterone. And right. so you're saying with 10%, you can feel that difference. You can feel that surge of testosterone. Yes. And, you know, we talked about in a previous time when you and I did something that people tend to think, okay, that they understand now they lose weight and their testosterone goes up. But you and I have also talked other things just go up naturally too. When you lose weight, other tests just start look, looking better. Your mm-hmm. good cholesterol goes up. People don't right. realize that your vitamin D goes up too, without even taking extra vitamin D, right? Your 25 hydroxy goes up. I didn't so, know that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's, you know, I gotta know, I, I gotta know something that you don't know and vice versa, because you know a lot that I don't know. So I've got to look good in front of the men's health guru. Um, but the, but the, really the point is, now I have been, I have in my experience come under the assumption. This is I know from the research, but you see, you see the you see the patients. I mean, you have the the busy clinic. What we've seen in the research lately is if you're losing the weight quickly, or if you're losing the weight slowly, you still get those testosterone bumps. You still get benefits because people are always preaching. Do I got what if I lose my weight really quickly, or if I lose it really slowly? Do you see a difference with quick weight loss losers versus slow losers? No, I have never seen a difference between quick and slow losers. I see it in all those, all those losers of weight. So you do. Oh, and quick. Yeah. I mean, I think testosterone surges at different levels throughout the day. As you know, Um, it's highest in the morning hours. Um, It's lowest in the evening hours. And um, there are two different surges in the day and it it, um you know you so it's it's always going to be there's always going to be some variation when you measure that's natural variation but those you much prefer to surge up in this range rather than have that variation down in that range you know yeah yeah you feel that difference the mean value yeah the average value yeah and if some, if someone comes to the clinic, do you tell them the best time to get their testosterone checked this early in the morning as, as a lot of the websites say, or do you, do you not, do you not care when they get it checked? No, we, um, we have in our labs universally that people should have it checked before 11, before 11 o'clock. Yeah. And that comes from the FDA. That's not necessarily the literature or the evidence, but that comes from the FDA because that's, and because of that, if you have to Um, submit to insurance companies when the level they look at when the level was done the time Mm. to make because you need two low levels with the presence of clinical signs and symptoms in order to treat testosterone deficiency you just preach something that gets me really excited that people need to understand that if you have testosterone deficiency and someone's thinking about putting you on medication it's not just having the low numbers you also have to have the symptoms. Mm-hmm. And in my experience, sometimes just people say they have a low number and then they go somewhere and get testosterone. Do you, can you comment on that? Can you tell them, can you repeat that, that it's not just the numbers, but it's also how you feel? Yeah, no, absolutely. Because the, the data, the literature shows that up between 35 and 45% of men have low levels at some time. Levels are highly reflective of acute illness, you get a cold, your level goes down. You certainly, if you get a shot, an epidural steroid injection um, for your back or your knee, a steroid injection in your knee, or you have asthma and you take a course of steroids, your level of testosterone after that goes down. Um, Your, um, if your mood, if we go through a serious event, I see men who go through divorce or the loss of a child or loss of job, 
and a sudden um, loss in life will cause depression and sadness and grief, and that lowers levels for a sustained period of time. But it's only when those levels are persistently low and you have over time symptoms um, and signs that are manifesting testosterone deficiency that I believe you need treatment. We don't treat numbers. We treat people with clinical signs and symptoms. That is, that's such an important point because I kind of give it, it's kind of analogous to me of thyroid hormone. You know, there's so much thyroid hormone being dispensed. Mm -hmm. Now a lot of the endocrinologists say, you know, we just don't treat numbers. There's got to be symptoms also. And so people have to get used to that in testosterone because we have so many men that still say, well, my number's 200. I feel fine. Maybe I need a little bit. And someone tries to talk them into it. And, and that's the, I don't know if you want to comment. I don't want to put you in a controversial right. position. No, no, no. That's it's what you say. That's the dark that is, side. Of there testosterone. is a dark side. I mean, it's, it's the dark side is that everybody thinks it's bad and that there's, um, and it's, it's thought of as a steroid and steroids, especially performance enhancing steroids are bad. The truth are that hormones are hormones, they're messengers. Low levels are present for um, a reason. Low levels do not occur in isolation. Mm. Um, we know what the normal range is between 300 and 1100 nanograms per deciliter. Well, that's a huge range, a huge range. Yeah. But when we're talking about low levels in the 200s and the 100s, they occur in men associated with what we call comorbid disease states of aging, meaning hypertension, um, el blood pressure elevation, type two diabetes, obesity, which we yeah. review. In younger men, you see it with HIV, with um, chronic opioid use, right. those men on Suboxone come in and their levels are really low. They're almost at castrate levels. The truth is for years, those men have not been recognized and not been treated. They have such low levels that they're, they feel like they're going crazy. They're fatigued. They're, their mood is irritable. They're down. They're, they're unmotivated. They're overweight, especially in their bellies. And they, um, besides their sexual dysfunctions, and they need treatment, but low levels and the presence of clinical signs and symptoms. Okay, so before I want to even think about even going on medication or even talking about it, let me see if I can repeat this in my brain. A couple of these, you're telling me I got to lose about at least about ten percent of my my body weight, right? I got to lose that to see a difference. I got to get how I got to get how much sleep are you seeing when someone gets X amount of sleep? It usually means healthier testosterone because you you were you were implying there was a correlation there, too. Right. Right. So men who um, have a sleep disorder. Yeah. There are several types of sleep disorders. The most common one is obstructive sleep apnea, where men are awakening um, even for seconds or, or moments during the night. They often, men can awaken and they, they say that they awaken to urinate. The truth is that they awaken because they're sleep apnea and then they have to go, they feel their bladders and they have to go to the bathroom. Those men need their sleep apnea treated um, because they're hypoxemic, which we said in the discussion. Yeah. And those testosterone levels are low. So we have to treat those. I'm not saying you shouldn't you have to do one before the other, but you have to address them. You cannot just give testosterone. Right. So you're saying if I can improve my sleep, some parameter of my sleep, that can also increase my number. Yes. Right. Yes. What about what about extra exercise as a standalone? Do you see do you see testosterone increase with exercise? Well, I, I see. I never see men just exercising alone without trying to do other things. So yeah. I can't say that. Um, but I see men feel better, and but I can't correlate their testosterone levels just to exercise. But this is all synergistic, right? When you start, it's all synergistic. Process, right? It's not one out of the other. You know, it's just exercise alone or sleep alone. It's hard to do those studies, and that's why the studies are not well done. Yeah, and you touched on something briefly, but it's a big deal. It's a big deal, and I want you to just comment on it again, just briefly. 
painkillers, pain medications, those can squash testosterone or they can drop your testosterone, correct? Correct, correct. Opiates, men who, I mean, you can, opiates are generally in this country now prescribed for short periods of time, postoperatively for a very short period. Many who have any, you have any kind of surgery, you're supposed to take the medication for three or four days at most. And yeah. you're usually only given that much medicine. Um, but met, people who have chronic pain and are using these medications and those, the number of the use of those medicines has certainly diminished in the treatment of chronic pain, but it's still there. Men who use those medications daily do have lower levels of testosterone because they suppress the pituitary gland. Okay. Any comment before I talk about this new study that came out that I felt, I'm kind of getting, I'm a teaser, I felt it really solidified or, or helped your preaching look really good. And I'll get to that in a second, but do you want to comment on men who have been treated for prostate cancer? They've been treated successfully. Maybe they're three or five years out. Do you still believe it's adequate for some of those men if they qualify for testosterone replacement to have that discussion? Or are you still in the camp of there's no way in HE double toothpicks that someone should take testosterone replacement after they've been treated or cured for prostate cancer? No, I, I'm, I'm not in that camp. I, I believe that men who have low levels, and we should say that men who undergo a radical prostatectomy and, um, or men who have prostate cancer treatment, whether it's XRT um, and the other means, of course, is androgen suppression therapy. So we're suppressing the release of testosterone just because we're suppressing the release of testosterone as a treatment for prostate cancer does not mean that testosterone administration at a different point causes prostate cancer. So I'm of the camp, the camp and I think most of the, my peers that testosterone does not cause prostate cancer, although the product insert of any testosterone replacement says that it increases the risk of prostate cancer and breast cancer. Mm. We're not convinced that's true. However, after prostate cancer treatment, if men have sustained low levels, we do treat those men um, in conjunction with their oncologist, their okay. prostate cancer doctor. Here's where I'm going to make you look really good. And this actually happened a few days ago. So I always tell people that we, we update in the interviews data up until the point of the interview. Here's the headline I woke up to a few days ago. No early cardiovascular risk with testosterone treatment. Data on long-term safety needed, however. And they're describing a new presentation at the Endocrine Society and then published in Lancet, the medical journal, that says although we need more studies, we're not finding this cardiovascular risk uh, that some people were nervous about, at least right now. And we're waiting for more studies, but I thought, cause you've been, can you just give the audience, the people who don't know you, they, everybody knows you in the medical world, but in terms of the patient advocacy world, we, you came from a history of, hey, you know, we're making a big deal of these cardiovascular risks that testosterone replacement in the right person has a good safety record. And now it's suggesting that might be the case, but can you take people through what you thought and what you think now based on testosterone replacement and cardiovascular risks? Testosterone administration for the treatment of testosterone deficiency as a clinical condition with low um, levels and the presence of clinical signs and symptoms really wasn't done until after 2000. And it was with the release of a topical treatment called Androgel that in 2001 that it really started, that primary care doctors and other doctors started prescribing testosterone therapy. And the number of prescriptions written went from $1.2 million in 2001 to over $3 billion in 2013. And the number of treatments, um, therapies written were significant. Yet, I don't think we ever discerned um, the exact reasons why people were prescribing treatments for testosterone therapy. Mm. It went unfettered until the 
release of a publication in 2013 in JAMA called The Vegan Trial. That's the first last name of the author, the first author of the study, which showed that there was an increased risk with prescriptions of testosterone therapy in men who um, had um, a history of heart attacks prior mm. uh, to the treatment of their testosterone therapy. And perhaps that within the first three to six months that the, inc the risk was increased in men, especially over the age of 65. And they used a database to show that. Again, a cross-sectional study where there was an association. Um, and there was that study was followed by another study the February thereafter, which was very shortly thereafter, um, that also suggested this increased risk. And those two studies together caused the FDA to uh, put into its label that testosterone should not be used in men older than 65 or for low levels related to aging. And yeah. the FDA also said that it should be discussed with the patients that testosterone may increase the risk of heart disease, meaning heart attacks or stroke. So that suddenly people became firmly implanted and saying that we should not prescribe testosterone therapy, that it's a made up disease state, that it's, um, um, that it's of no value and it actually is increasing the risk. So mm -hmm. shortly thereafter, as you know, Dr. Morgenthaler and a group of us published a, a pretty um, a significant review and meta-analysis in the Mayo Clinic in 2015, which reviewed all the studies of testosterone and cardiovascular disease. And what we found is that low levels actually predict higher, a higher association or greater incidence of heart disease risk. And that um, perhaps, but not clear, that men who are treated with their low levels have a reduction in cardiovascular events. The study that has been ongoing looking at that in older men mm -hmm. is called the Traverse study. And it ah. was the FDA ordered that we have a long-term safety study. This is coming up on six years. It's four, over uh, 4,000 men with low testosterone levels who are being prescribed testosterone gel versus placebo gel. So those men will either be on a testosterone gel or placebo gel, but it's a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, the results of which we hope to have out in October of this year, which will reflect on the first longest and largest study of its kind on safety of testosterone prescribing. So that Traverse study is really a game changer because in, in, the, in the press release that I read this week about, hey, this might not be so bad, it said, um, one of the authors said, I'm eagerly awaiting the findings of the Traverse trial. Right. And he said, it's going to be completed in the next few weeks. And yes. Is that, is that right? So it, it's right. basically almost done. And so, yes. do, mm -hmm. so this one should be presented soon. So we don't know the results yet. We don't, we can't, we don't know the them. results. Okay. But let me, let me just play, let me play angels advocate or devil's advocate. Cause I, you know, you know where I spend, I stand, I stand in the world of lifestyle first, and then you can throw meds and do whatever you need to do next or do it in combination that it can't just be meds all the time or supplements. Let me just say one thing about that. Okay. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big lifestyle person too, but I often find that testosterone deficient patients don't have that motivation that, if you give them testosterone for a short period of time, yeah, one to two year period, perhaps you can motivate them to do that, what they need to do. I so couldn't disagree. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, not disagree. I'm sorry, but what, yeah, no, and I should have rephrased that. What I'm saying is when that specific person has to go on med, if you really want to get the biggest bang for your buck on that med, then you have to still follow lifestyle changes when you get the prescription. Right. Right. We say right. this in prostate cancer all the time. If someone just writes you a script and then you go, go home and go watch, you know, the Super Bowl, sit on the couch, you're really not getting the most bang from your buck from that medication. Um, so it's that synergism. So no, I, I couldn't agree. I don't want to, I don't want to ever sell the idea that lifestyle cures everything. I want to sell the idea that the patient always has their part to play mm -hmm. and the prescription is the easier part. The patient has to 
um, uplift that prescription and the results of that prescription or keep the dose low by following lifestyle. And that's where I think you and I agree, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. so here's the traverse trial. So I'm gonna play angel or devil's advocate. What you're saying is we're about to get results from Marty Minor of a trial that's gonna change the way we look at testosterone, good, bad, or indifferent, right? Right. Okay. If the trial, this isn't, this is my biostatistical the biostatistical mind, epidemiology mind. If the trial was supposed to go six years and now it's at year six, is that correct? Yes. Is it okay? And that it wasn't shut down early right. because of an adverse events. Yes. My guess is they're either going to find nothing or whatever they find that could possibly be concerning is not that concerning. Am I following? Am I, is, <laughs> yeah, no, like, I don't. I don't want to do this to the audience, but this right. This is no. I, I, that's I, this frankly, is my life predicting. Th this is our lives too, and yeah. frankly, that's how we all view this study. That if it, okay. what's happened with testosterone trials in the past, if there was any concern about safety, yeah, the trial is stopped early, and that's what you're referring to. Exactly. And when the study. Um, is allowed to go through completion, it usually means that it's either neutral or positive. <laughs> and, but you yeah. can't conclude that because until this study is published. But those of us who eagerly await the study and have waited for it for years um, are looking at it with some eagerness. It's also a study of efficacy. And okay. efficacy means the treatment of clinical signs and symptoms. And one of the most interesting clinical signs that um, are going to be treated is, is mood. And, ah. um, and that's going to be assessed. It's a secondary um, aim in the study, a secondary um, study parameter. But it's a very important because we have no long-term data on mood. But what most men say is that with poor mood, that they're much with low levels, they're much more irritable. So you, all, you think that if you give men testosterone, that you're going to increase aggression and you're going to increase irritability because you associate irritability with increased ag aggression. And yeah. you associate lower, higher levels with, well, the truth is that as men increase their levels, they feel more calm in my experience. This is my clinical experience. Yeah. And their mood improves. And if you look at small studies of just 30 to 50 individuals, you'll see that, or meta-analyses of, of a thousand individuals, you'll see that there is an improvement in mild to moderate depression with testosterone treatment by itself. Yeah, that's that's but, really interesting. And so that's that's also a, a um, that and together, not only cardiovascular risk, but sexual um, function, performance, desire, and um, and um, other um, and the safety measures of the Traverse let, study. Let me tell you what I'm really good at besides a lot of things in my mind. I'm really good at at <laughs> corner, cornering the speaker and making them feel so guilty that they have to return and there's no way they can say no on camera. So I'm about to do that to you. What we're about to get, which you enlightened me on in the story this week is the Traverse trial. Is it, am I spelling it right? T-R-A-V-E-R-S-E, -E, Traverse? Yeah, Traverse. Okay, so this is yeah. a big deal in medicine coming out, like you said, by the fall. Mm -hmm. What I would like is that when the results come out, good, bad, or indifferent, but my prediction is going to be, you know, not, not disastrous based on the fact that the trial's gone six years, would you come back with me and at least in the short term, explain what the results mean, good, bad, and indifferent? Of course. Okay. I will. Yeah. Thank you. See, that's how I make people feel guilty. Like, what were you going to say there on camera? No, of course you were going to say yes. And I appreciate that. All right. So I don't know if you have anything else. I'm going to, I want to, I want to talk about testosterone replacement in one other capacity here. In my world, you were known uh, recently and you got a lot of attention for looking at a group of men that receive testosterone, but based on their weight, they may need more of the medication. So um, can you talk about that for a moment and why that is the way that may be a big deal? Because it, to me, it's a big deal. Yeah, I've always found uh, th that the clinical protocols that we use for testosterone therapy have never been based on weight. They've just always been based just on dose. And we use one dose and we start every man on doses. And 
what's most important, of course, is that we follow at three months levels again at three months and six months, but we don't really, um, and we try to optimize men's um, clinical signs and symptoms to those levels and change. We might have to titrate down a little bit. Occasionally we titrate up a little bit, but we never begin. The most important time that I found in when I be initiate testosterone therapy, and again, it's not, in my mind, it's not testosterone therapy for life. It's testosterone therapy as a tool for a period of time until they correct the, the lifestyle derangements that are including obesity that are contributing to the testosterone deficiency. Thank you very much. Now I must thank, I'm just going to interrupt. Thank you for saying that. It makes me crazy that there's not this discussion. And look, we don't, you don't want to be on this drug for life if you can help it just, just to get you to a better place. Right. Sorry, right. sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. So, so um, what I was finding with a particular form of testosterone therapy that we were doing the phase three studies of, it was a, an injectable. It was similar to the injectables, um, which have an auto injector, um, the diabetes meds that we were talking yeah. about. This is an injectable into the, um, the belly uh, that men would give themselves of testosterone and a dose of testosterone and anthate once a week. So I asked us to 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 look at the cross sectional um, in terms of the, to look at the group in terms of weight. And what I found is what you'd expect is that men with a higher BMI greater than thirty required a larger dose of testosterone to normalize their levels meaning in the eugonadal range between 450 and 700 um, versus those men who are under the, the B and BMI of, of uh, 30. So we've written a paper about that. We presented that at, at the different meetings. Um, it was the first study of its kind that actually looked at something that we should have been looking at perhaps for a long time, which is the use of testosterone therapy in different size men, that yeah. larger men may require larger doses for repletion than smaller or more slender men. So, you know, I think DOG spelled backwards. I thank God that you did that paper because for my career, we have yet to touch on the fact that so many medicines are probably based on weight, you know, not just mm -hmm. some of the cancer meds, but the chemotherapies, but there's so many meds, I, we, the, the bone health meds, some of the newer ones may be based on weight where some of the leaner individuals will get a really strong effect on this, on a dose and someone who's heavier will get less of an effect. I can tell you uh, in my world, that's even true going back on some of the older vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, there was a paper going back to the 80s, which caught my eye when I was in first public health, that larger individuals had less robust responses to hep B vaccines. So what, what I'm trying to say is that that might seem like a paper you did, but it's a paper long overdue that not just testosterone, but in a variety of areas, you may need more when there's mm -hmm. more weight. I agree. I agree. Thank you. So, Okay. So I think we're going to move out of the testosterone realm, if you don't mind, unless there's something else you want to talk about when it comes to testosterone replacement, because I want to talk about my favorite topic to talk to you about, because we've always we're already going too long. And um, of course, just to check in on the interest here, the DOG is still on my lap. Enjoying <laughs> the Marty time refuses to leave because he's scared of the wind back there. <laughs> um, we, us men got to stick together. I just got to make a quick side comment before I talk about weight loss. You had a slide that I have never thought about in 35 years of publishing. When you set a place for mom advertisements, you're right. I have never seen, I'm laughing with you. I've never seen an advertisement that set a place for dad. No, there isn't. I mean, as, have men's health deteriorated to that level where we just die so much earlier and we have so many more comorbidities that nobody even wants to sell to us anymore? I mean, I've no, never it's, thought it's about kind that. kind of a sad state, but it is. You know, the, I think medicine was so male dominant for so long that in 1994, when they established the Office of Women's Health, 
And then um, it was, and there's been no, I thought about establishing an office of men's health because it's never been gender-based because they thought that we as men had all, all of the medical um, initiatives directed towards us when the truth is that we never, we as men in the Commonwealth study and every study thereafter in 2000, we as men have never utilized the medical system. We mm -hmm. think of ourselves solely as providers. We are we go to the doctor, we're uncomfortable at the doctors, we're uncomfortable with any medical intervention or surveillance. We think of it as a sign of weakness. And it's so true, even if men are so anxious to come in and talk with me at the Men's Health Center, because they think, wow, I'm advertising that I have erection difficulties or yeah. I have low testosterone and I don't want people to know that. Yeah. which also creates a surge of, of, um, of, of virtual interventions like Roe or for hymns, which are selling ED drugs, but marketing them to a much younger age group for different purposes um, right. than we may agree or disagree with. But, but they're not doing health surveillance. They're not looking at preventative. They're not looking at men's lives, men's health Overall, um, they're not um, looking at lifestyle in a significant way, although some of them are addressing smoking cessation and yeah. and HPV vaccination and things like that. Yeah, it's unbelievable. But it made me think of something before we switch to weight loss. I'm sorry my mind is dancing because I'm I, I, there's so much. We, you know, Usually when I'm interviewing someone, we're talking about one topic. And with you, I get to talk about 30 different ones. Um, what I learned from a lot of people in sexual health, and tell me what your experience is, is that sometimes if you do testosterone or Viagra or any of these things and you enhance male sexual health, um, I, I've heard this many times that the partner, if you're not also paying attention to the partner, they'll not be happy with that end result because they're not raising it together. They're not moving as a unit. Do, do you have any experience with that? Um, oh, of course. Yeah. No, I mean, because what, what, what you, what you're talking about is highly nuanced about the couple's sexual health or the couple's yeah. sexual experience. Male sexual health isn't all on the erection, but the focus with Viagra or sildenafil, which is the medication, the generic of Viagra, or the focus with Tadalafil in the bathtubs and the implications yeah. uh, are that if you improve male erections, you're going to improve overall couples' intimacy. And there is some truth to that because the, the, it's, it's highly nuanced. Men stop touching or being touched if they have erection difficulties, mm. they fear proceeding to intercourse because it marks intercourse or the inability of a male to get an erection marks them as a um, as either a poor level and their poor lover and they're ashamed. Even if they can't get an erection, they don't want to be physically or sexually or often emotionally intimate with their partners. Mm. So this sexual component is connected to all of those. And what men have to recognize is that sexual intimacy with their partners, and they do recognize that. I think they really are more sophisticated than most women or that we give them credit for being. It's not all related to their, the hardness of their erections. Mm -hmm. Yet, if they don't have a hard erection, they feel poorly about themselves. Mm. And if you feel poorly about themselves, it's hard to feel okay about yourself as a partner, as a provider, as a father, as, um, as a worker. Mm. And so the erection has much more meaning than just the sexual sphere. No, I mean, I appreciate it. Cause I just, cause there's always a partner in that room. Right. And right. Uh, that partner is a part of the process. And that and partner, it's, it's best if men can talk about that, but the trouble is many can't. Yes. And that's right. women go through a change with menopause 
where intercourse can become painful for multitude of reasons that we can't go into here, that can be corrected, some of them, to the point where it's not necessarily painful if a woman would speak to her provider about that. Yeah. Women are much more likely to engage their providers about that. Um, but men, when they start to fail or fail to keep their erections or get an erection, they feel um, very negative, not towards their partners, because women will feel that their men are not, their partners are not attracted to them anymore. Mm. But for the most part, it's independent because it's a vascular issue. Yeah. That's what the, they have to know. No, that's really important. And, you know, and then we can go down the road, you know, the same sex couples. Right? Yeah. And then um, I don't, you know, I mean, again, I just think it, it, whoever the partner is, whoever they, the partner is, they have the, to be a part of the process. They and have to be. If I hear another person tell me, it doesn't matter who they are. I've heard this all the time is that, Oh no, I'm, I'm not bringing my partner to the visit. Uh, I just, I think I always tell them when they call, if they call or anything like that, I would say, go in and see this person together. It will, that's the only way you can move right. forward. Anyway, I, I have two large, more. I have two large leather chairs that people sit in my office and we talk first before right. I examine them. And there are two chairs for the partner. The partner comes, whether it's male or female, comes less than. 15% of the time. Really? Less than 15% of the time. And I always ask men if they're there without their partner. Did you invite your partner here? Uh-huh. But I wait to the end of the session because I don't want them feeling guilty or anything. Because they, I think they all recognize that they would have valued having their partner there. So I actually write them out their instructions, what wow. we're going to do, our plan. I write out our plan at the end of the visit. So they'll have a formal way of talking about this with their partners that is really interesting but, first of all i didn't know you i didn't know you had two leather chairs in your office because you know like me you work in preventive medicine public health and, and you're right. a clinic though so you know you're always on a budget so i'm afraid i bought not, those I, my, my own money <laughs> <laughs> you're pro that's probably true which is so sad yeah um, so i didn't know you had the leather chairs but 15 percent come on really yeah. really, really? Really. And I don't, and I always find out if it, a lot of the times, most of the time, it's not because their partners um, don't want to come. It's because the men don't want their partners there. They don't want them. Uh, they're, they have already, they're so ashamed. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. they haven't been able to overcome that. And they haven't even talked about that. Uh, well, maybe this will change it. Because truthfully, if you go to a lot of lectures, even consumer lectures, public lectures, people don't talk about the partner, the couple's condition. So maybe just us talking about it, we'll get that 15% to 30% in your office. That All would right. be really nice. I think we can do that. Um, so anyway, I we've covered that. I said I was going to do that for 15 minutes. We did it for almost 45. Let's just, let's focus on the other topic that we get a ton of things, a ton of questions on it. Before I go into the meds, let's just briefly touch in the Mark Moyet areas. Let's talk about weight loss right? You and I will go to our graves. Let's just face it. I'm an optimist. Look, glass is half full. We are going to go to our graves. This is such an epidemic of obesity that is going to take, I think, generations to fix. And we're, ch we're trying to chip away at it. So let's just talk about the little steps before we talk about the new drugs. You seem to, you seem to be a big fan of low carb diet. Are you, are you, or, or I am, I am. I think it's easier um, to then total calories, it's easier to count carbs. You can identify carbohydrates. Um, so I, I just think it's, and I think it's, um, also a way within a short period of time to, um, to stop carb or sweet craving. And I think that's what's so one of the more difficult hurdles initially with, with any nutritional change in your life is craving sweets. And I mean, sweets or carbs or simple sugars create a desire for more sweets Okay. until you don't feel very good. <laughs> well, first I'm going to support that. And then I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Very few people realize 
because I do, you and I do the same. We peer review, we peer review a ton of medical articles, whether or not they get accepted. And we take that as an honor and it's a pain in the gluteus maximus. It takes me all day to do a paper and we'll never get a prize for it, but it's the right thing to do. The paper, the, the one paper, the most impressive paper in men on hormone therapy for prostate cancer, for androgen deprivation therapy that resulted in weight loss that nobody wants to talk about was men on a low carb diet for six months these were men that did not have testosterone. They did not have the metabolic advantage. And I remember reviewing the paper and it's out. The average weight loss in that group was 20 plus pounds. And these are men that don't have testosterone and they're going strictly low carb. So if for anyone that says that low carb doesn't work for weight loss, even in prostate cancer on hormone therapy, at least preliminarily, that's not true. We, you can see pretty good success. And it sounds like you've seen really good success with it. I have, whether it's in keto diet, I mean, you can have low carb, all types of low carb diets. That's right. So. Yeah, low carb comes in many forms, right? Forms, many I flavors, mean, all, right. Most, yeah. I mean, basically all ketos are low carbs, not all low carbs right. are ketos. So you have more right. flexibility, right? Right. And, right. and but, but the, the question then becomes, you say low carb to the patient. Do you give them a handout? Do they talk to a dietitian? How, how do they in their mind know what low carb is? Because I know it's an easy word to say, but it takes a little bit of practice and learning, right? right. Well, I tell them that every bagel, most bagels, just depending on the size, yeah. have about 50 grams of carbohydrates. And a, a tr normal diet consists of between 250 and 300 carbs grams of carbs a day and a low carb diet is less than half of that so i try to give them an idea so you don't eat you're not eating much bread and you're not eating a large number of grains right. um, and you're not eating starchy vegetables <laughs> potatoes yeah. Yeah. You know, so you're eating a lot of protein based meats, fish, chicken, poultry. Um, and you and I think if you just set your mind and make it simple with forget how much of a caloric calories you're getting in this particular um, diet. Although if you follow a true low carb diet, you're not going to be eating a whole and there are healthy fats that you have to incorporate. You're, if, as long as you don't overdo that healthy fats component, but you're yeah. not fretting about it, it's not that difficult to live that simply. Yeah. Especially if you use timed eating, meaning some inter, potentially some intermittent fasting, mm. which may or may not be a value for some people. Like you said, it, it doesn't have to be all in one day. You can just start to cut the portion of carbs that you normally get. It right. doesn't mean you can never get bread. It doesn't mean you can't. No, you don't. No, 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 not at all. And you know, if you're going to go to your grandchild's birthday party and have cake, of course you're going to eat cake. You know, that's... <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Well, there's two things I notice about it. One is it, through my career is good. And the other one is the catch. Um, the good part is people will always say that I have so much energy. You know, I, the, people, and even I feel that way when I go low carb, I just, I just feel like I have an abundance of energy. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't sort of drain the system. It doesn't make, you know, the pancreas and work overtime and everything else. Um, the catch is, and I think people has to be told, and you're going to laugh. And is that, you're going to laugh only because of the banter we've had over 20 years with this is that sometimes people really go hardcore, low carb, and people forget that fiber is a carbohydrate. So they get constipated unless they watch for their bowel movement. So, uh -oh. you know, I, I, I always sell. <laughs> <laughs> so what the audience doesn't know is that I'm always pitching. I'm not pitching all brand. I don't work for these companies. I just say all brand buds, some type of fiber some type of fiber from plants. I said, it's good to keep the train moving and the train is not slow, it's not too fast, but, but right, I mean, it, the constipation part is a challenge for some of these trials. It is, it always is, yeah, it yeah. Is. No, and, and I talk about that because it's, it, you don't feel good if you're, feel, if you're constipated. I mean, that's right. the complaint every day that you see. Yeah, yeah, so <laughs> I group just- of people deal. I just wanted to throw in that. I wanted to throw in my, my shout out to flaxseed, you know, golden flaxseed, which 
just on a tablespoon can give you three or four grams of fiber and great omega-3 from plants and put that in my oatmeal. So these are a lot of, I know there's carbs here, but you don't have to have a big portion to keep the tree no. moving. All right. Anything else on that? Because I want to finish up by talking about something I never thought I would talk about in my career. And we've talked about it before for physicians. And that is weight loss with these new amazing drugs. And so we did a thing together called semaglutide, also known as Wagovi, game changer. And it is a game changer, but you mentioned the catches. The catches are the ridiculous prices the lack of insurance coverage, and probably the fact that you have to stay on it for life for a long term. But can you repeat to the audience, and, and what you said in one of your slides is so important, because this comes in several forms that people see on TV. They see it as rebelsis, mm -hmm. they see it as ozembic, but these yes, are different yes. dosages. But now the FDA approval of the weight loss injection is Wagovi, and so, this is the drug that everyone thinks is a game changer. And there's another one hanging out in its class called tirzepatide uh, or, or tirzepatide, T-I-R-Z-E-P-A-T-I-D-E. Okay, that's the way. I always know spellings. I don't always know pronunciations. Can you basically tell the audience again why you think, unlike the past, these are true game-changing meds that should be in discussion for people that need the help with their doctors? Yeah, I think um, for years, what's been used by doctors for weight loss, and this goes back to the 60s, um, are the stimulant medications. So yeah. things that we've, we now use maybe exclusively for a, um, ADD or attention deficit disorders um, um, with the stimulant meds, have long been used, um, quote, as diet pills. The trouble with all those, those medications as a class and as individually is that they all elevate blood pressure and heart rate. Exactly. And when you elevate blood pressure, regardless of how much you elevate blood pressure and regardless of how much the FDA might ascertain an elevation in blood pressure is safe, there is no true safe elevation in blood pressure. <laughs> there, every blood pressure mean elevation right. is associated with a greater risk of mortality or event. Any medicine, and the FDA is very aware of this, and it's the newer class of testosterone medicines that have been approved have gone through um, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring where people have to wear a blood pressure monitor while using the medication in its phase three trials prior to approval to see what, what blood pressure elevation occurs. We know that testosterone, because it's a steroid, can elevate blood pressure. And so it has to be monitored closely by the provider or clinician who prescribes testosterone. Um, all of those meds that were given as diet meds in the seven, 60s and 70s all elevated blood pressure. Yeah. So indirectly, they were increasing the risk of heart attack and stroke. Yeah. So yeah. these new meds actually lower blood pressure. They lower blood sugar. They increase insulin levels, but they don't cause insulin resistance. They lower after a period of time that belly fat. That's inflammatory fat. It's not normal fat. It's great if you're a bear and you're hibernating, but as human beings, we're not doing either. <laughs> so we um, need to get rid of this belly fat that we see as we age, and we these meds reduce that. They reduce cravings. They reduce hunger, and they you eat less and you feel full and you're at overall reduced risk of death by using these meds. So if you're going to need a med, not all meds are created equal. Yeah. Uh, there are meds that have good effects and bad effects. We might need a low dose anti-anxiety medicine like an SSRI like Prozac or 
or um, sertraline for life. We might need a medicine to help with heartburn. We have to look at these meds safely and see if they're um, effective and if they're safe for long-term use because many of us dealing with the stress of today's world are using these medicines to manage these constant um, continuous lifestyle stressors yeah, and disease states that come with civilization. And if we're going to need a medicine to, to maintain our weight, because we saw that a reduction of at least 10% in weight reduces mortality significantly, it should be a safe medicine. Yeah. And that's the game changer of these meds. The trouble is right now, there are no generics and there are their expense is ridiculous. Um, people are willing to pay for them. And Novartis, the maker of Wagovi, can't even make it fast enough to keep it stocked. That's just unbelievable. But, you know, there's other ones coming along in the class. Like I said, I'm trying to learn. This is all new vernacular for us. So the semaglutide your game changer. Tears of a tide is maybe with a future game changer that's working as well. But what you said, what people don't know is thousands and thousands of doctors watched an exchange that we had in the past. And you said this, and I didn't think about it, that the weight loss has been so significant from these drugs that they're starting to press upon, in some cases, bariatric surgery results or weight loss surgery. Right. Can you talk about that again briefly? Well, this is the only drug when I was going through in the talk the, you saw those changes in obesity and these placebo controlled trials after one year were less than 6%. With bariatric surgery, you can achieve between 15 and 18% weight loss of body mass over a year to a year and a half. With these medications, you can now um, achieve that same weight loss as bariatric surgery or with a medication and maintain it. Okay. So you realize, and I'm just telling you after the video, when I was traveling, I was at a meeting and somebody came up to me and I've had this happen several times. They said, I saw your exchange with Dr. Minor. I went on that drug. I've lost 20, 25 pounds. I really like it at first although I had some nausea and the nausea is a big side effect of it. Big yeah. side effect. The nausea is, and then it got a little bit better. So everyone has these GI side effects, but he said, but they said, I really like it. But then I kept thinking, you know, how are people affording it? So if a lower dose version is Rebelsis and Ozembic, the two commercials that people see on TV, I mean, what are you going to do now that people can't afford it? Are you going to try to get them those lower dosages? What, what's the deal with that? I, I've been, uh, this may sound like um, uh, I may identify myself as a loser, but I've been asking the primary care providers to prescribe those medications. Have. We have not been prescribing them in our, what in my center, I find that if I want to start, if I want the patient or the patient that I decide to start statin therapy or more aggressive blood pressure control, I, as a former primary care provider, meaning an internist or a family practice doctor, believe that it should be under the responsibility of that person who's um, entrusted with the overall health of that individual. My role is as a consultant. So I, I give a patient the information about these meds, I write out their dosages, I but I don't prescribe them yet because I I want them to have a conversation with their PCP. Right. So, because, so but that, but then that would make sense that so you're saying that you do advise them that if they can't get the the stuff that's so expensive would go away. They they talk about I, I tell them to start at the low dose diabetic diet. Okay. Diabetic dosage. Because okay. these are all very dose dependent. The what go that you know, and they're slightly different in their dosage adjustments. But yes. you can basically start the first two size uh, or dose preparations as the that are prescribed in the type two diabetic. So you so you tell the doctors and the patients to think about right. talking with their PCP 
Revelsis, because I don't mind using trade. I don't work with any, I don't work with these companies. And oh, I think, Zipek, yeah. And I think, the, and, the, and the patients as well as the docs, in my opinion, have always thought by trade name. I know that we want to believe we know the generics. Look how hard it, it was for me to pronounce tears of, tears of a tide. But um, so you say Rebelsis and Ozembic have a discussion about that. Those, right. That one. And, but you need, you know, you need certain laboratory parameters. Yeah. So that, so that example of that man who is pre-diabetic with an A1C, people should know their A1Cs. Yes. And that man who had a 6.1 A1C, he's empowered now that he has, he wants to get it down. He wants to get it down to 5.7 to 5.8. Yeah. Um, that can be done with that medication, but, um, and it, he may not need the full effect of the weight loss. He may continue to lose weight with that medication, but it's worth getting it just with that elevated A1C. Yeah. Yeah. Our dog is getting restless because I, uh, he likes the prostate men's health talk, but he doesn't have to lose weight. So he's now wants to go see us. I just wanted you to meet who was listening to your lecture. Oh, wow. Kratzi. Kratzi, say hi to Dr. Mike. Hi. Hey. <laughs> he's say great. Hi. Say hi. Did you like the lecture? Wasn't the lecture <laughs> amazing? Isn't he the best men's health doctor ever? You bet he is. He just said something. All right. Um, so, and I want you to also reiterate the fact that in these trials, people were making diet and exercise changes, but on, but the drug on top of that just gave them the home run, right? Right, right. It's a tool. It's a tool, like you said, about sometimes using testosterone. Mm -hmm. So at least we were able to cover the other two versions of this drug if people want to ask about it. Mm -hmm. uh, Rebelsis, which is a tablet, correct? That's an oral. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and ozembic which is an injectable right i got my, right. my hands all over the place right. i have to memorize all this stuff and so i think that's really and anything else so you talk to them about low carb and then you talk to them do you so you really don't talk about any other meds right now for weight loss because they just haven't come anywhere close right no i don't no i don't i don't use any of them Mm -mm. <laughs> well, I mean, my, no, my no, I, I, you don't understand how happy that makes me because I thought the weight loss category was basically just debris all over the road. I'll give you the analogy that I, I, I struggle with this for so long. You'll appreciate this. People kept saying, well, I don't understand. Okay. The, the, one of the biggest selling drugs got pulled from the market because it raises heart rate, blood pressure. I said, a weight loss drug is not supposed to increase your risk of dying younger or giving you a cardiac event. If, no. if that was okay, you would encourage patients to smoke to lose weight. Right. <laughs> right, because if you smoke, you can lose weight and people still lose weight by smoking, but it damages you from head to toe. So you really lose the quality game and the longevity game. So I came, I thought the analogy of why you don't prescribe these other drugs is because they become kind of akin, some of them, to the smoker's solution to losing weight. Is that fair? That's fair. That's fair. That makes me feel better. I appreciate the therapy. Well, I want to end on hemoglobin A1C is such an important point, uh, test for glucose control that every man watching this should ask their PCP about getting a hemoglobin A1C test. Right. right. I get okay. it on every man that comes in my office. You do? Yes. That's just, that's just awesome. That's awesome, Marty. And, and the last thing... I want to talk about is, you know, I remember guys like you getting up at meetings and Mulhall, these guys talking about PDE5 and Viagra and Cialis, but you know, these ended up being fairly heart healthy. They come with catches. And I just, I just read in clinical trials, some of the largest interest in terms of cognitive improvement or studying cognitive improvement in dementia Hang on sildenafil is on sildenafil. <laughs> and we right. know that a version of Viagra is sold to reduce pulmonary artery hypertension, right? Right. So right. we know head to toe, it improves blood flow. Right. And so it's right now moving to clinical trials in the area of dementia and prevention of dementia. So I gave you a little introduction. Is there anything else you want to add? I, it turns out well, I agree I think... with you now. I agree with you now that maybe we should be looking at these meds more. I, I, I have to be very honest. Um, this is not on label, but I have men, most men taking five milligrams of Tadalafil or Cialis nightly, which you can get 90 tablets, even though it's not covered by insurance with good RX 
for $17. Um, so 90 tablets for three months supply. And I have them take it at night before they go to bed. It has virtually, it's free of any side effects, doesn't have the flushing or congestion or headache, of, and it may protect against heart attack, stroke, and dementia. And it certainly will help their BPH, lower urinary tract symptoms as they age, and it will help their sexual function. So it's kind of a multi for one deal. So they, so they, they pee better, their sexual health can improve, and you, and you feel at this point cognitively. It may improve. We don't know that. Those right. are, that's another association, another longitudinal study. So, wow. Okay. All right. You know what? I mean, I can't believe how much we've covered today. Did I miss anything at all? I'm looking around and I'm trying to see if did I miss anything or did we cover everything you wanted? Because for me, we went 30 minutes more than I thought I would get with you. And if there's another topic, I'm happy to talk to you. But Dr. Marty, Dr. Minor is the man. <laughs> and I say, Marty, Marty. Marty, Marty, this is a men's health thing, right? This reminds me of the fraternity. We used to yell that. So I had to put you in that mood. And then look, I just want to say something that's in all seriousness before you sign off. I want to thank you for all you do. You've been a really good friend. In fact, you're the only person that when I ever come to town always comes to my lecture, even if everyone else bails out, you were always the guy who would come and sit there. And then we'd have a beer at the bar, but um, you were, you always came, I always came to your lectures too, but you're loyal, but anytime I ask you to do patient ed or any kind of education, you always jump at it. And so I just want to thank you for being you. I've appreciated our relationship. And I just think you did an HE double toothpick of a job today and really educating men and their partners about men's health. So I appreciate you a lot. Thank you. I appreciate you, Mark. Thank you, Dr. Moyad, and thank you, Dr. Miner. That was amazing. So if you found this information uh, helpful, you can go ahead and visit our website, pcri.org, and find a lot more resources there. And if you would like to help us get these prostate cancer videos all around the globe and shared with other patients and their families, maybe consider a donation. Any amount helps. Next up, we have NBA All-Star, Mr. Grant Hill. We are so honored that he's joined us here at PCRI. Dr. Mark Moyad is a huge fan, and he's going to interview him on his basketball career, game, the new book that Mr. Hill has. It's actually an autobiography, super interesting. And he's going to be talking about what he does as a pro athlete to take care of his health. Mr. Hill has been doing an incredible job doing work in prostate cancer awareness and men's health awareness in the past season, and we're super excited to have him here. Welcome, Mr. Hill and Dr. Mark Moyad. Holy mackerel. I got to <laughs> welcome. This is, you know, I've done a lot of interviews at PCRI and outside of PCRI. Uh, but in a moment, you're going to realize why this is going to be one of my favorite, regardless of how it goes. <laughs> and, and, and I, I want to call you Mr. Hill, but can I call you Grant Hill? Can I call yeah, you please, please. Grant? Can I call you Grant? It's Grant Henry Hill, right? Yes, sir. The reason why PCRI started this new conference, because we have the largest of conference in the fall globally. Then about eight, nine years ago, we were asked to do a Moyed Soul Spring Conference. And then suddenly people say, why don't you do men's health awareness? You talk so much about other things besides prostate cancer, over the health disparities, hypertension, cholesterol issues, diabetes, vaccination, you name it. So they said, will you be our moderator for that too? And I said, yeah, I mean, but I'm really tired. I'm getting old. And they said, well, we got Grant Hill. And I said, oh, baby, I'm in. So <laughs> Grant doesn't know this. This is going to be his favorite interview in a long time. So uh, Mr. Hill, Grant, I really appreciate you showing up here. Thank you so much for our first annual Men's Health, Moyad Shoals Day, PCRI, whatever you want to call it. Hey, I appreciate you. Thanks for having me. And uh, I know you're, you're tired, so I appreciate you, uh, <laughs> you, 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 you will, your willingness to do this here. Uh, you know, it's going to be fun. I guarantee you it'll be a lot no, of fun. No, I guarantee you. Let me tell you how excited I am and why 
first of all, I, I, I decided no introduction for Grant Hill. And I'm going to tell you why. I went to see Michael Jackson in, in, in Cleveland when I was in college. I sat front row center. My friends sat back. And they said, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Jackson. And I went, like, what? That's it? And then everyone went crazy. And then, and then I realized in medicine, you know, throughout medicine, the doctors that want the longest introductions are the most desperate for attention. They're the people that nobody knows, right? So then I thought, everybody's always giving Grant Hill all this stuff. I've memorized your entire bio. Then I thought, look, this is ridiculous. When I tell people I'm interviewing Grant Hill, they know who that is. So I'm just going to say, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Grant Hill. Well, well, Mark, well, Mark I, I, first of all, I appreciate that. Second of all, I might have been at that concert. So, <laughs> really? Yeah, so we were on the floor. We were kind of center, like, I don't know, maybe 20 rows back in the middle. My dad played for the Browns and was, I think, working for the Browns at the time. And this was the victory tour, right? Was this? The victory tour. And so my dad and I and Ozzy Newsom went to the concert together. And if you saw Ozzy Newsom, who was obviously a big deal at that time. Yeah. Uh, there were a lot of people there, so you might not have saw him, but you might not have seen him. But I was with Ozzy and my father at the Victory Tour on the floor. We might have been sitting close to each other. You never know. See that? Kindred spirits. Well, the funniest thing about that is uh, I waited in line all night to get tickets. So I got tickets for all my friends. And, and the person at line said, we have one ticket in the first row center and the rest of them are in row 10. And I thought, I stayed up all night. So I took the one ticket and sat by myself in the center. My friend sat in row 10. And even in a Super Bowl, I can remember, I, I got into a Sinatra concert long ago. And they said, ladies and gentlemen, Frank Sinatra. And I just, it kind of, I started thinking that everybody wants these great intros. But the reality is, is, is the name itself and the work itself should speak volumes. And I just thought, in terms of what you've done, and we're going to go through it over the next 30 minutes, throughout a lot of things, I'm just going to say, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Grant Hill. And so that makes me happy that you saw that victory tour, too. That was an awesome, awesome tour. So what you don't know is I was all county in Ann Arbor. I found my trophy. <laughs> all county, honorable mention, all state. I played Division Three for several years. I was supposed to be start in Division Three, and instead I declared pre-med, so I didn't play my senior year. Uh, at a small school in Ohio. I still have the points record in Ann Arbor for most points, I think, going back to 40-some without a three-point line. So this is why I'm also excited because of the basketball connection. And I know you've heard of me in basketball, I'm sure, right? Well, you know, I did live in the Detroit area back in the 90s. And uh, from time to time, I would go over to uh, Michigan and, and hang out, particularly early in my career there. So the, the name, even back in the 90s, uh, was still big in the basketball world. So uh, I'd imagine it's still, you said those records, no three-point line. Um, I'm sure, I, and I haven't been in Detroit in a while, but I know back in the mid nineties, that, that, no, that name was somewhat familiar. <laughs> okay, thanks for making me feel good for two seconds. All right, <laughs> here's what I wanna do before I go into this book. Uh, quick prediction, Celtics or Warriors? Warriors. Yeah. I like that. They got, a, they got a Michigan player on there, a Michigan State player on there. That makes me happy that you predicted. And the other thing I want to ask you really quickly before I go into this, because I got a copy of this over the weekend. I had two days to read it. I read the whole thing. Oh, you did? Oh, wow. Okay. I read the whole thing. 21 chapters, almost 400 pages, and I loved it. Oh, well, thank you. This was the first quote of the book that jumped at me and spoke to me. You said, at, when you talked about the twin branches court, you know, we play pickup games. In Ann Arbor, we had a place called The Cage. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't show up and you lost, you didn't play again. I mean, you were bounced. And if you were good, it didn't matter. You, 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 you were put on a team. You said a purity has always existed in basketball. The game is rooted in democracy. And you referred to that when it came to the twin branches court. And I don't know why that had deeper meaning to me. But there's something about basketball and equality and democracy. I don't know if you want to comment on that. That has always been interesting, you know, because when you talk about getting along with other people, I always thought that basketball was the great equalizer. You know, if you could play, you could play. 
And whoever is whoever was on your team, I mean, yeah, you had fights and different things, but you would always get along. You depend on each other. So I don't know if you remember that quote, but for that just jumped out to me in in one of the first few chapters. Yeah, no, I mean, it it, it that's one of the, the the beautiful things about the game. Um, you know, I, I can't play anymore because my body's banged up. But um, you know, I've always said with basketball, you could go anywhere in the world, and and not speak the language um, and, and walk onto a court and you can quickly learn to collaborate with your teammates um, and figure out how to be successful. And I think the game itself requires that. I mean, obviously there's great individual performances uh, in, at all levels, you know, the NBA, at the park, wherever, um, but to work together. I also think you can size people up. You can quickly Okay, that's the shooter. Okay, he defends. He, you know, he, um, you know, he sets good screens. Okay, he's the playmaker. He's the vocal person. He's the one that talks and has personality, and 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 so you can quickly learn about people. And you know, to me, look, I'm I'm a fast forward to present day. I'm an owner now in, in Atlanta with the Hawks, and it's beautiful when you go to a game. You see people from different walks of life. You see people with different ethnicities, different uh, political views, uh, different religions uh, coming together uh, to, to watch a team play and support a team. And last year we had a nice deep playoff run and, and, and everyone puts aside their differences and comes together. Uh, so basketball and sports, I think in general, can really unify people and, and bring people together. So I think the spirit of of, of that quote was, you know, sort of speaks to that. Now, I do think in saying that, I've always felt that on a team, basketball is a pecking order. You know, I mean, there's, you know, <laughs> as I like to say, the, the ball will find the right person's hand. If it's game point and it's, you know, we're going to nine and it's eight, eight, and we're on offense, the ball's going to find the right person's hands. <laughs> and if the wrong person takes the shot and it's a bad shot and they miss, then that person might not get picked. And so there's a, there's a bit of a pecking order, as I'm sure as a former player you understand, but there's a beauty in the collaboration. There's a beauty in everyone working together, um, you know, for, you know, for success. And, you know, you're only as good as your weak link. And and um, and so um, so there, there, there's a spirit about the game that I think I was drawn in too early um, that really kind of just speaks to that and really was there throughout my entire playing career. It's sort of looking at I always say when you look at puzzle pieces or you're trying to figure out the best type of medical care, you know, you're not going to take one of your players and play four players in the court against five everybody has a role and you got to find out all those people on your team, your medical team, they're all going to have somewhat similar and different roles and they're all needed to be on the court. You, you can't play with three and you don't want to play with four. And that could be nutrition. That could be lifestyle. That could be PT. That could be the doc. That could be the, the assistant. I want to summarize your college experience. Sorry to do this. The late you passed the ball to Leitner who hit People don't realize Leitner hit the shot to beat Kentucky. Now, if I remember correctly, you don't win that game. You don't go play Michigan, right? Isn't that the same year you played Michigan? Yeah. And, and that was the same year you beat Michigan by 20 in the championship. So in my, in my convoluted mind, has, if Leitner doesn't hit that shot at the, uh, the last second to win the game against Kentucky, Michigan wins the title. Because, <laughs> right? Because they're they, they could have beat the other teams. They were beating them. So it's incredible because we always talk about the person who's the hero, but I don't know how many people realize, and I watched that shot. You threw that the length of the court with your right arm one-handed, right? So here's what I got to ask you. Had they guarded him well, I mean, you hit him perfectly. What was option B for you? If, if he's guarded, where were you going to throw the ball to win the game if they're guarding him? You know, Coach K diagrammed the play, and, and there were some other options. Like Bobby was going to be streaking one way and, and, you know, possibly throw it to him. But, you know, I, I knew leaving that huddle to walk back out on the court, I was throwing to Christian. And it's interesting what you think in those moments. And 
you know, I'm thinking as I get out there, oh, they're not putting anybody on me. And so now I have a clean shot. We had a play similar uh, that earlier that year where we lost, one of the two games we lost at Wake Forest. Similar scenario. Uh, they put somebody 6'10 on the ball. I threw, I threw a bad pass and it led to a turnover. So now I'm walking, and I remember talking to Christian after the game and like, look, next time I may step back. You know, they put somebody in the ball, you can yeah. step back and give yourself more space. And so I was like, okay, if I'm in that situation, I'll do that next time. So I walk out there, there's nobody on me. I'm thinking, okay, this is easy. Instead of thinking, they got two people on Christian. You know, yeah. so they were yeah. double teaming Christian. But I was just like, look, he's the tallest guy out there. I'm going to throw it up there and give him a chance to make a catch. And thankfully, they were so fearful of fouling him. Uh -huh. and they had that Matador defense kind of ole. And, uh, and he was able to get a clean catch and then ultimately a clean look. And uh, and win that game and deny Michigan the championship. There you go. Exactly. I mean, we got blown out in the in the second half. I mean, they did all right, but that was an incredible throw. And you watch it; it's a one-handed. You didn't even grab two. You just and then let you just took one. I don't know. I just wondered what. I just wanted to know what Plan B was that they guarded you or what you were going to do then. Okay, so you win all. <clears throat> you win two championships. You go to the finals of another. You have this incredible college career. Um, but the, you said something at the end of a chapter, which was interesting. You said, basically, when you were done with basketball, and I was happy you said this, you said, now I realize I'm not playing for free anymore. Yeah. And so I just wanted to do a quick question on that, because my whole career, even at Michigan here, almost 30 years, I used to get in so many fights with the alumni about, look, you got to you got to pay these players. I used to play. 365 days a year. Oh, we got, we got our laundry done. It was exhausting. And so this NIL and all this happening, I don't know, where did you stand on players getting paid and name image likeness? I mean, just where do you stand these days with compensation for players? Is it yes? Or is it a middle ground or where, what? I did join a couple of years ago, the board of directors of the NCAA. So I've been very much in, in the mix of, of, of all of this. And, um, Look, you know, I, I was a student athlete. One of the things that that I remember vividly was, you know, going to the bookstore to buy my father my jersey and it costing like $120 to buy my own jersey. And that still sits kind of awkward. To, you know, the rules are such where you can't, as an athletic department, give the student athlete the jersey. That's a violation. Uh, so I wasn't mad then about them making money and I'm not getting a piece. I was just mad that I had to pay for my own jersey. Like that wow. was, that was to me, uh, that upset me. But you know, it's been controversial. I, I, I do, th I, I do like the NIL. I think where we currently are, it's a little bit chaotic, and I think it, there needs to be guardrails, and I think there needs to be uniformity. And so, when you have different state legislatures, different state governments with different rules as it relates to NIL, then it just creates even more of an uneven playing field. So, um, you know, I, I, you know, if the NCAA maybe was more proactive years ago, we wouldn't have been in this situation. Um, but it's a little bit of a mess right now. And, um, and so it, it, it easily can become pay for play, which I think that's a whole nother discussion. But, you know, in, in theory, if you can figure out a way where athletes can benefit from the name image and likeness i don't have an issue with that mm -hmm. i don't think we're there right now i think we you know the floodgates are open and there's not much the ncaa can do really congress can come in and and, and override some of these state laws you know the question is is that going to happen you know yeah. and so um but yeah i mean it's it's intercollegiate sports is rapidly changing and evolving and I think you've seen some coaches, some legends retire, um, you know, kind of maybe before their time. Jay Wright just retired. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Coach K, obviously, he was getting up there in age. Roy Williams. And I think yeah. a lot of them see the writing on the wall and they just recognize this is going to be very, very different than what we're accustomed to. And, and maybe we're not cut out for what this is ultimately going to look like. Mm. So I think I got like seven minutes with you. Five minutes. So this is this is what I knew would happen. I get too caught up. So let me can we just talk now about 
a little bit about, you know, you're with this, this ProVenge campaign, Start Strong. And um, why did you decide to, I, I want to talk to you just about that, and then we'll finish up. I, I wanted to finish up talking about lifestyle a little bit. And I'm sorry we didn't have time to cover the pros. I got my Grand Hill Detroit Piston. I want to give you my shout out. Look at this. Oh, I man. You. I got my USA Grand Hill number oh. five jersey, baby. You, you know, took way back. I like yeah, that. So imagine I'm wearing, I'm doing this in Ann Arbor. So if you don't believe that basketball is the great equalizer, I am willing to take any flack about wearing a Duke's, a Duke, a person's jersey, right? I'm, Look a at, I'm willing I'm a to piston. go in the streets and I'm a wear piston. this. I'm a piston. No, I know. I know. Yeah. That's what I think is so incredible. I mean, you were a piston. I got your piston t-shirt up there. Wow. So tell me about the, this ProVenge campaign and Dendrion and prostate cancer. And, you know, you're going to be 50 this fall. So uh, I expect to get invited to your birthday party by now. I figure we're best friends. So yep. I, so why get involved? And is this something you see yourself doing long term? Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's a great question. Look, I, I first of all, as an athlete, I had a number of injuries, setbacks. I learned, if anything, you have to uh, take ownership of your health. And when I was introduced and informed in recent years about uh, the issue with prostate cancer, and particularly with the African-American community, some of the racial disparities, um, I, I knew I had to you know, get off the sideline and get into the game. Uh, I was almost embarrassed that I didn't know um, you know, how it disproportionately impacts African-American men. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, to, to be able to partner with Dendrion, uh, you know, and, and to really, you know, roll out this Start Strong campaign to raise awareness, uh, to give uh, men uh, and women, spouses, mothers, uh, you know, sisters, whatever, um, to give them a playbook on how to deal with this. Um, you know, we culturally, don't typically like to go to the doctor. And obviously, if you can go annually and get screened, uh, it less, and, and if it's caught early, as you know, um, it, it, you know it, it can be treated and you can uh, extend your life. Um, and so just educating, raising awareness, informing the community, giving them the tools necessary to deal with this, uh, we have to bring those numbers down yeah. And uh, but a lot of it is just it's it's making making people aware. And yeah. sadly, a, a lot of men in our community, they, they know about prostate cancer, but they don't they just almost it's almost nonchalant in a lot of ways in terms of their attitude towards it. Um, and so just getting people to be proactive and advocate for themselves. And uh, and so, I, you know, obviously, I know people who've had prostate cancer, but it hasn't hit my family. I, my, my dad, myself, we haven't had it. Um, but I'm at that age where I have to be you know, careful. And um, so that's why we're here. It's a great campaign. And obviously, the work that you guys do, uh, I think, you know, we talk about sports and collaboration and the spirit of collaboration. Well, all of us working hard to try to bring those numbers down and, and change this narrative around prostate cancer, particularly in the African-American male community. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it because I always thought one of the biggest problems is when people look at the spokespersons, and I've got to work with most of them, the problem we ran into is a lot of times they were 75, they were 80, and that's, you know, all respect there, but we needed the youth movement. I think it's interesting that at PCRI, the person running the show that took us, that helped take us to the next level is 30 years old. No. Yep. And my point being is it's like coaching. It's like anything else. If you don't start bringing in the youth movement, then you don't have the vision on how to really change this disease. So I'm going to, and what I mean by that is you're also doing something in an ancillary way. I don't know if anyone ever mentioned to you. And this, this happened, New England Journal of Medicine published this going back to April 29th. It was a diversity of the national medical student body. It's called four decades of inequities. What people don't realize is that the patients, yes, but we still have less than 5% of our medical students are African-American men and women. And for mm -hmm. African-American men, for as an example, I mean, it's still stuck at like three and a half to 4%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we could talk about inequities all day, but if we're not training and teaching and, and having more African-American men and women doctors, um, what are we doing here? And so I also think these ancillary benefits of what you're doing is going to get more people excited to go into medicine. That's my thought. What do you think? 
Yeah, no, I, I hadn't thought about that, but I think that also plays a role in us. I think it also speaks to um, the relationship that the African-American community has um, with medicine, not just from a patient standpoint, but also pursuing it um, as a career, getting into medicine, studying, you know, becoming a doctor. Um, I, I don't know. I don't, you know, it's funny. Like, I, I, it's not funny, but it's interesting. I feel like as a black men, we only go to the doctor when there's something wrong. And even when there's something wrong, we're hesitant to go. And I don't know why, I don't know if it's trust, I don't know if it's whatever, you know, but I just, I, I, it's, it's just something we have to change. It's not just as it relates to prostate cancer, which is obviously critically important, but it's, it's just your overall healthcare. Mm. And take, you know, I, I've mentioned this before, and obviously, you know, this, 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 this slogan is, is, can be controversial. I don't think it should be, but it can be. But, you know, in the recent years, we, we hear about Black Lives Matter. Mm-hmm. And, and we have a good idea of sort of what that means and, 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 and what that encompasses. But to me, taking care of your health is Black Lives Matter. Advocating for yourself is Black Lives Matter. Going to the doctor annually for checkups is Black Lives Matter. Mm. So, you know, if we care uh, about Black Lives Matter, then we are going to get in the game. I'm not asking you to, you know, eat wheatgrass and, and run five miles a day. I'm just asking you to go see the doctor, inform yourself, know what questions to ask, know that you have a right to get a screening, what screenings are available, uh, and just take care of yourself. And so to me, uh, we can, like I said, so we can change that. But to me, like people dying too soon prematurely, the impact that it has on our community is devastating. Mm-hmm. And so encouraging people to be more selfish so they can be selfless to others. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, yeah, Black Lives Matter. And, and part of that is the totality of that is taking care of ourselves. Yeah, no, that's fabulous. And uh, so, I mean, your message is, to me is spot on. The other people, other people are going to get excited about medicine and healthcare. And, there's, and here's where I want to end the day, if you don't mind. And it, and it really is too bad because I wanted to ask you if you ever played President Obama in a game. I wanted to ask you about scripture. Uh, you know, I'm out. Well, I Obama, to go I, your... I, at his 49th birthday, I was invited and we played pickup basketball. You yeah. did? Oh, yeah. that's amazing. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and you're going to. You're not, you're going to end right there. You're not going to say that you, you know, you easily so, won. So, okay. I'll tell you the story. So he invited um, a bunch of us in uh-huh. Kobe, LeBron, Chauncey Billups, Shane Battier, Magic oh. Johnson, and we had four different teams of like eight guys and we played pickup ball at an army base. And, um, and so we played against him. And so the, the great thing is that the last game, uh, well, but first of all, but we all we all joined in center, uh, the, 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 you know before the game at half court, and he mentioned to us that see those men that are around with you know they all have machine guns and they shoot on my command, and so um, but we went out and played and and you know like do you go and try to like block the president's shot like you know but he did hit a game winning three pointer on Derrick Rose to win that particular game, and then they ended all the games after that, and so it was like. It was like one of those things where as a basketball fan and someone who plays basketball, he said, you know what, if I were president of the United States, I think I'd invite all these basketball players to come play pickup basketball. And sure enough, he did that. And I think he had a great time, but I know all of us had a great time who participated as well. Oh, uh, that's, that's an awesome story. Yeah. I mean, I understand that. I, I mean, if you came to Ann Arbor and we played pickup ball, I, said, I would, what am I going to do? I wouldn't want to get you hurt. I mean, I'd let you shoot the <laughs> ball. I don't want to. I would, I would just be excited to be playing. That's, that, that was, that's a great story. Okay, so here's how I want to end it. And I, I've never seen anyone, you have to correct me if anyone's ever asked you this. And this is what really resonates the most with me and you being involved now with Dendrion and Provenge and the Start Strong campaign. It's something that you don't even say. And I don't want you to kill my perception here. Here's my reality. Very few people talk about that when pro athletes, including all and college athletes, all many of my buddies, when they age, a lot of them age ugly. And I don't mean, I'm not talking about fit. I'm not talking about face. I'm talking about gaining weight. 
Right. Comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, the diet goes awry. And what's shocking to me is all the guys I used to play with, how many of them have needed a lot of treatment for a lot of things and their lifestyle sort of went off the rails. What always shocked me about you is that you had this frame and you had this height and this weight and now you're 50. And I, I know the numbers might be different, but you look like you still stay in shape, like you still watch what you eat. Because I know that you hired a chef when you were with the Pistons. Um, mm -hmm. I read that part. And who does that? Hires a chef instead of always just eating fast food. So is have you always had this attention to lifestyle? Because I you had talked about not even drinking in college. That was the time we drank, right? So right. can you comment on that? I think your greatest asset is not just your youth in prostate cancer. It's the perception I get when I see you that, damn, this guy still takes care of himself, even though he's had like five surgeries and he says he can't even run anymore in his book. He still seems to take care of himself. Please tell me that that is the case still. And I don't even know if there's a question there, but give me your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, it's been an interesting journey. I mean, I think um, I got into, you know, sort of sports nutrition, diet, rest, recovery, all of that when I was in Detroit and then went through a series of injuries and missed a lot of time. And now I'm coming back. I'm not the same player. Um, but just taking care of yourself and, and, and really doing it to be able to play and play as long as I can. And, you know, when you get to 37, 38, 40, and you're going against 20 year olds, you know, you got to be smart about what you eat. You got to get, you just got to be on point with all of that. And then in retirement, you know, it's a whole different rhythm and routine now. And, and so at times I've, you know, I, I'd say in the last two months, I got back on, uh, I, I, you know, I took for two months, like during the tournament and, you know, you just, you stop working out, you're having these late dinners. You're, 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 and so it's finding that right balance. I mean, I think genetics play a little bit of role, but I also think we have the power to make these good decisions, nutrition, exercise, um, how we manage and deal with stress. I think all of that plays a role in your overall health. And uh, nothing on me at this point is functional, but cosmetically, I guess it looks decent. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, I just, I want to be able to be active and, you know, play golf and I can't run anymore, but I want to have a nice quality of life. And I know that investment that I put in now will is paying off and will pay off down the road. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what impressed me about the book. I mean, we just, the way you try, the way you took care of yourself, it wasn't just the fact that you didn't get an agent, but you got an attorney to do your deals. You had the chef. I mean, so basically you still do have that attention to d detail, you know, it, even though you can't exercise like you want. And I, I think that's one of your biggest assets in me, because what we try to sell all the time is people will ask, and I got this sign, I got a couple of signs to end it. And we always say heart healthy is prostate healthy, meaning we try to make this too complicated. People say, what can I do in my diet? What can I do in my lifestyle? Well, exercise to reduce your heart disease risk also reduces your risk of prostate cancer, lowering your cholesterol, uh, lowering your blood pressure, lowering your blood sugar. All these things that we have found that are heart healthy turn out to be prostate healthy. So I'm always trying to tell these men and at the meetings, just think heart healthy, think heart healthy. It's gonna take care of your prostate. And the last few things I wanna say, Duke and Michigan, yeah, baby, right there, <laughs> right? And PCRI, right? Look, I'm serious. I do want to thank you for all you're doing. I mean, we've been trying forever to get the young guys involved, and I'm, I'm, I'm in my late 50s, and to get a soon-to-be 50-year-old as one of our spokespeople is just a dream come true. And my last shout-out is it comes out, you know, June 7th. This, right. came, this came out June 7th. I read the whole thing. And 21 chapters, I liked it. It spoke to me. I, I, another message in there was, you know what? When you interact with the medical establishment, uh, don't be scared to advocate for yourself. Second opinions, no big deal. You got to get a third. That was something else that came out from the book. So I don't know if what you want to say, but I just appreciate your time today. I really do. Yeah, no, this has been a, a fun, lively, entertaining, uh, informative interview, and I've enjoyed it. And I appreciate the work you do. I appreciate the, um, the, the, the love for Aduki. Uh, and uh, I appreciate the, like I said, the incredible job that you guys are doing. And I'm glad to collaborate and have this discussion. And hopefully we can do it again in the future. It'd be fun. Yeah, I would love, I'd love to do a part-time at some point if I can talk 
I can do a little bit of a, a pitch there. And I would love to finish off the conversation in your later years, your, all your accomplishments, your involvement with Black Art. I mean, you've done uh, the diversity of things that you're doing, plus being a family man. It's, you know, you got two daughters and just being a great role model. But um, yeah, no, Duke and Michigan can come together. There would have been a Fab Six. Um, <laughs> exactly, you exactly. played. I mean, you would have started, but I think so. It's all good, but um, I, I hope I get to see you uh, uh, again for a, a part two. But uh, I hope you can stay with this campaign. Uh, yeah. We need we need guys like you, and we need guys to sell lifestyle. And even I saw an interview on you where you were talking because you're always keeping it positive. You know, all these people talk about not people not getting vaccinated as athletes, but the majority of athletes did get vaccinated, as you said in an interview. It's like, right. come on, the glass is half full here. You know, people. So I don't know. I. So I don't know if there are any lasting words by you, but I, again, I can't, I can't say it enough. Thanks for your time. Yeah, yeah this has been great. And um, yeah, and I, I look forward to uh, hopefully doing this again. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, great, good luck with the, the, the conference or convention. And uh, hopefully, I think we need to take this on the road, you and I. This, this was uh, <laughs> uh, good. I agree. <laughs> Two powerhouse universities. We'll That's do more right. of we would do more awareness on the road than anyone could ever imagine, you know, and uh, that would be just awesome. And it's, there's just a high energy there. So uh, thanks again. Thank you, Mr. Hill. And thank you, Dr. Moyad. It was such an honor to have you. If you would like more information on men's health and prostate cancer, you can visit our website, pcri.org. The link is in the description below. Also, while you're at it, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We come out with new prostate cancer videos every week. Next up, we have our founder and executive director, Dr. Mark Scholes, and he's going to do a slide presentation with Dr. Moyad and actually cover Q&A from questions that have been submitted for this event. They're going to be covering heart disease, bone health, cancer screening, diet, weight loss, and so much more. I know you'll find this informative. Again, we welcome our executive director, Dr. Mark Schulz. Welcome to the first annual, we don't have an official name for this conference, but it's supposed to end in men's health conference. So we can call it the Moyad Shoals, the Shoals Moyad, the PCRI, Men's Health. You can call it whatever you want in the first annual, but by the time we have a second annual, I'm sure we will have a solid name for this conference. <laughs> and we will talk about my incredible interview with Grant Hill, Dr. Miner's talk. We'll talk about all that. But what I first want to do is introduce the one and the only Dr. Mark Shoals. And again, I haven't talked to you since the last conference. You, you always promise me that you're going to call and we could just have a conversation, but we always just end up meeting on YouTube. What is this about? What kind of a relationship is that? There must be a name for it, but uh, it's, certainly, uh, it's certainly unfortunate that I miss out on you during, the, uh, during all the free time that we have between. Well, what it's called is, I think, a contemporary relationship because it's all by video. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you, to, you know, That's... so, but, you know, in the old days, just for people, we would talk all the time. But everyone knows Dr. Schultz, uh, world-renowned oncologist, father, family man, grandfather, BFF, and all of that. And, um, you know, I can... I can go on for a CV about eight years, but like I told Grant Hill, you reach a certain point in your career where everybody knows your name. So if you try to read a long intro, then people think you're an egomaniac. So <laughs> everybody knows who he is. Everybody knows his ties. His ties are very loud generally. I appreciate them, but I go tieless. I go sans tie. So what we're going to do here in this part um, is I, we're going to talk about a little bit about men's health. And this, these are Dr. Scholz's uh, slides that we're going to comment on together. And we're going to cover various aspects of men's health. And you, you called this living longer without being a fanatic. Why did, you call, why did you call it that? There's a lot of practical stuff for our health as we're 
men ourselves uh, that are uh, are not being implemented. And then, uh, as we all know, sometimes people go overboard and they, you know, they they're they're running from the inevitable. That we're all mortal, and we know that that there is a downward spiral that happens with age, uh, sadly. And so sometimes people get a little bit uh, freaked out and and uh, you go go into their medicine cabinet, and they're on 150 supplements, and uh, somehow I think they believe that that will, uh, you know, create some additional value. So I, I like a balance between, uh, you know, what are some of the obvious things that can help people live longer, uh, but, um, don't, but, but aren't extreme. All right, so we, yeah, so we're, uh, this is, we kind of covered this, is uh, screening for health problems is not a very, uh, sexy, interesting proposition. And a lot of guys never even get to doctors. I, I see patients who come uh, with prostate cancer and, you know, men that have uh, been there, done that, have good careers. Uh, but they're, uh, sadly, they'll come in with a prostate cancer that's, uh, you know, the PSA is over 100 uh, because they never got checked. Uh, the uh, people get busy, they forget. Their health has always been kind of a quiet, uh, uh, wonderful thing that never bothered them. And th then all of a sudden they got caught by surprise. So uh, this uh, little idea of uh, you set up a clinic to do men's health screenings, you're going to go out of business because guys just don't show up. Now, I'm in a little different situation because people are coming to see me for a different reason. They've already been told, most of them, that they have either a high PSA or prostate cancer. And so... Once we, we get them in the front door, then we can do some of these other things to make sure that we don't miss some obvious problem. I, I thought, that, I, it took me a while, but I thought that slide was actually funny when I figured out that those were spiders and spider webs, by the way, that nobody goes to a men's health clinic. Um, I can just tell you after 30 some years of being in one place, uh, I, was, I, I have been in on many discussions for men's health clinics and what should they look like. And the funny thing is, is I remember that people are still arguing, are they even profitable? Meaning <laughs> we're not expecting much volume. And so I think it's also part of the reason that some people today are equating men's health clinics with you know, a cash only business for a certain product, which is unfortunate because that's why we brought Marty Miner on because he started the first academic men's health screening uh, clinic in the country at Brown University. And they offer everything from A to Z, including lifestyle counseling. And that's really the way it should be. So unfortunately, I agree with you that this slide is still standard. Can I, can I comment on this slide also for a second? Yeah, of course. I think, I think what really got me on this slide was not only the fact that no one shows up uh, you're not going to get enough volume is I think part of it too. And you can't explain it in the slide is it's also a triage situation. What that means is that a lot of the main killers of men just don't get enough attention. You know, we constantly in prostate cancer are still talking about cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in men as well as women. And it's still the number one cause of death in men who have been diagnosed with prostate cancer because it's so common. And it's been yep. the number one cause of death in men and women for over a hundred years in a row. And so what I think of here, sadly, also is the idea that it's also people have to get a handle on what is their greatest risk, what could possibly end their life early from a menu of items. And it's important to go through with the doctor you trust, you know, what is in those top three or top five probability wise, you have those discussions all the time with patients. Yeah, our, uh, as we'll go through, um, you know, well, let's go back to the thing that does motivate people to show up and the, um, you know, the specter of prostate cancer, 200,000 new cases every year, um, and the fears related to treatment and the disease. Now that motivates people. That's something that people understand. And this is why I'm sort of at the at this tip of the spear in this whole men's health screening thing is because the idea of just looking for a problem when you're feeling healthy is not a very attractive proposition. But if you're already seeing a doctor who says, hey, let's get your prostate cancer situation lined up, and then in the course of discussion mentions that, hey, the number one cause of death really is, say, heart disease, then you've got their attention. Right. Um, so this slide is in here just to remind us that prostate cancer is not one thing. It, and 
people don't like the complexities of many moving parts and oh, I'm going to have to think and I'm going to have to, to uh, you know, it, prostate cancer is like saying, you know, females or, um, or, or, or Italians or something like that. There's all kinds of prostate cancer. Right. So, or, or, uh, or Schulzes. There's a lot of different Schulzes out there. <laughs> That's right. So, right. So That's you're, right. you're dealing with a uh, complex thing. And one of the most confusing things of all, of course, is that, uh, you know, prostate cancer comes in, in, in harmless forms. But just look at a common cancer, a much more serious one, colon cancer in general. Um, serious in the sense that if you catch colon cancer, your chances of dying are so much higher. And this is often the case for many of the cancers, lung cancers, pancreas cancers, stomach cancers. So the bottom line, if you go through all these stats here, about the same number of people are, are uh, dying each year, but look at the bottom line. If you're diagnosed with prostate cancer and it relapses after surgery, your average survival is 18 years. Mm. Whereas if you're diagnosed with colon cancer and you relapse after surgery, your average survival is 13 months. Now that's what we call a cancer. Well, it's something that can really take you out quickly. And of course, screening for colon cancer, we'll get into that in a little bit. But mm. uh, this, this is why when people hear the word prostate cancer and they think of it as one entity, they tend to remember the dreadful stories of people dying of lung cancers, colon cancers, and the automatic assumption is that they're dealing with the same thing, which certainly is not accurate. That's so, a, that's a, that was a, that's a really, I, I forgot that you had that slide. That's a, that's an incredibly compelling slide, isn't it? And what I wish people would understand is many, of course, not colonoscopy or sigmoidoscopy, but many of the, the preventive lifestyle changes that you make to reduce your risk of colon cancer are almost identical to the ones in prostate. Yeah. Which are almost yeah, a, identical it, to the ones in heart disease. So mm -hmm. rather than being intimidated by these numbers, people should realize there's a common pathway to prevention, or if you've been diagnosed and treated to doing what you possibly can do to reduce the risk of recurrence. That's, yes. that's, and, that's and my it, these numbers, these numbers, 18 year survival sounds fanciful. How could that possibly be true? But when you look at the technology we have in the prostate world, PSA for early detection, PSMA PET scans for early detection, incredibly active hormone treatments, uh, spot radiation to treat oligometastatic disease, uh, plus a generally much slower growing, much slower metastasizing type of cancer. Um, these numbers are accurate. So we're looking at a, a more of a chronic condition, even for relapse cancers. We're not talking about all the lucky men that have the active surveillance variants, all the lucky men who got cured with their surgery or radiation from the get-go, we're talking about the, pro the problem cases of prostate cancer. So, uh, so people need to realize that prostate cancer is, uh, generally speaking, if managed with expertise, uh, more of a chronic condition than an acute cancer. And, uh, and that's, uh, that word, however, is, uh, it's hard to overcome. So let's just remind everybody that there about half of the men diagnosed every year of the 200,000 men diagnosed, about 100,000 have a, something that was called a cancer many years ago that should never have been called a cancer because it never metastasizes. It should be watched, not treated. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately, the industry still calls it cancer with all those dreadful overtones that we've already covered. I know now they're proposing all these other names for it, Gleason six instead of calling it cancer, but some, all, some of these names they're proposing, I don't know if those will ever make it in front yeah. of our desk while we're alive. I mean, they, they want to use a more benign name, but um, anyway, that's a, no, that's, that's, a good that's true. Thank you for pointing that. Cause there are well-intentioned experts that have been working at the bureaucratic level to try and change Gleason six cancer into something like Gleason six growth. Or, uh, or you know, some sort of cellular hyperproliferation, and get word, get rid of that word cancer. So that would be right. great. So what is this? What is this type that people shouldn't worry about? It's lower PSAs, Gleason scores of six or less. Um, no, you know, no major engulfment of the whole prostate with cancer, uh, and then good favorable imaging showing there's no surprises lurking in a corner. If people have that pattern, they have something that needs to be watched, not treated. Okay. So Dr. Scholes, a patient comes in your office. You have got to have had this question before and says Gleason 6 in general 
is a very benign dog. It's like our dog, our dog's benign, right? Then mm -hmm. what's Gleason one through five? Why did, why, why is six, why is six the most benign? Why isn't five? Can you just basically give your quick summary of why six is the most benign and why isn't that not five, four, three, two, one, zero? Yeah, it's a good question because people, when they hear the word six, they say that sounds like action to me, not why it should be a one. <laughs> Unfortunately, right. we have a, a smart doctor, Dr. Jonathan Epstein from uh, Johns Hopkins that actually created a new scale and he renamed six one, thank God, uh, as it should be. It should be called a one. Uh, and he has a one through five scale. Uh, it's a much better scale. It's slowly being adopted and, uh, and it, it, it helps. Uh, what happened to one through five? Well, they were other, even lower grade variants that the medical system figured out finally weren't cancers and they got jettisoned all together. So they don't even exist anymore. Right. Uh, but they kept six because they thought, well, maybe, maybe this one could spread and uh, subsequent studies shows that it doesn't. So, uh, so six should probably go the, you know, the same, uh, the same route as the one through fives. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good explanation. So basically, in the prostate cancer vernacular, six is our one or six is zero. So our our numbers don't run zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six is the slow growing. But again, like you said, they're trying. They realize this mistake, and they're trying. Epstein's trying to make it a one. So thank yep. you for that, because I still get a ton of questions on that. Yes, and and. Uh of the 100,000 men that are eligible for monitoring, there are six because it's a harmless entity. As many as half are still getting funneled into treatment, having surgery, radiation. Uh, so this is, you'd think after all these years, we shouldn't be repeating these very fundamental facts, but it really needs to be stated. So how do you watch a six? Um, basically you get a scan once a year, Check your PSA a couple of times a year. And what are we looking for? If it's so harmless, why even bother with scans? And the answer is, well, these men still have prostates and so they should be screened carefully for the development of a new cancer. Just as a woman who has had uh, cancer in her left breast and successfully treated, uh, she can still have a new cancer in her right breast. So men that keep their prostates need to be watched for the advent of other new prostate cancers that could need treatment. When you talk about active surveillance in that slide and MRI, MRI you've been talking about for a long time, it would be a game changer. And a question that the PCRI and other people get constantly is, should I ever have a biopsy? Remember, I'm not saying ever, of course there's always exceptions, but in general, should people get a biopsy without an MRI? In other words, if it's just based on PSA and or rectal exam, especially PSA, should I get a biopsy or always bring up the discussion of the possibility of an MRI? Well, I, I think always, assuming you have access to quality MRI technology, I suppose there's certainly places outside the country that don't. Um, and um, But if you can get an MRI, I mean, the alternative is they, you know, they, they poke your behind a dozen times with a large bore needle. And that's, that's the, the alternative to an MRI. So an MRI is a non-invasive scan and it's more accurate than doing repeated stabs of the, of the prostate. Um, and of course the risks of infection are nil, whereas uh, you, know, you can get some bad infections from uh, jabbing needles through the rectum. So, uh, so yes, I think that uh, anyone that's wondering why is their PSA running a little bit high or if someone is, uh, if a doctor did a digital rectal, he feels a bump there, he's a little suspicious, I would always get an MRI first and use that useful information to decide whether or not a targeted biopsy is necessary to evaluate the, the abnormality if there's one uh, that's detected. There you go. Five, okay. 10 years ago, remember five, 10 years ago, you know, it was a rising PSA that would trigger a, a biopsy. And now the oh, idea it's still, it, it's still happening, Dr. I know. Moed. And, I know. There's hundreds of thousands of random biopsies done every year. And uh, it, why is it still ongoing? It's, it's reasonably effective. Uh, the medical systems are familiar with it. That's, they know how to get their, you know, their insurance reimbursed and the doctors know how to interpret the results. So it's been a tried and true methodology for over 30 years, but, uh, 
but I think for the sophisticated people that uh, are hearing this information now, they have a much better <laughs> Uh, chance of being happy with what uh, you know what's going to transpire if they get some accurate imaging through MRI. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point, and I think uh, one more point I'll leave the audience with, which you preach about all the time. Again, I, I listen almost I listen to almost everything that you say. Some things, of course, you and I disagree with, and we have verbal and altercations, and sometimes they get physical. And generally, <laughs> I win those wrestling matches, but. <laughs> The idea is when you get an MRI, you really get a, a pretty good, it's not 100% accurate, but a pretty good estimation of prostate size, prostate volume. And, yes. right? and then that helps yes. you go to PSA density. So the one thing mm -hmm. I'm not seeing in enough places advertising their MRI, MRI is saying, hey, you know, this gives us a really good idea of the size of your prostate, which then can help us determine PSA density, which then gives us even more information on what to do next. Absolutely. So, so people have always been stuck with this idea that the normal PSA is four. And uh, that is probably because the average prostate of a, say, 65-year-old man is around 40 cc's. And so if you take the 40 divided by 10, you get a PSA of four. So that, that ratio of 10 to one is how you get a sense of whether your PSA is actually low, normal, or high, depending on how big your gland is. So if you have a 80 cc prostate, that would be twice as big as the average guy your age, then your PSA could be as high as eight or even 10. Uh, and we wouldn't necessarily have to postulate there's a cancer problem. We'd just say it's just a big prostate. So very, very important. As you called it, the technical term is PSA density, but it's really just the ratio between how big is the prostate, how high is the PSA. Mm. And, if, and if they're in equilibrium, then you say, there's not a there's not there's no message of cancer here. This is mm. just a message of a big gland, and uh, what a difference! I, who you know? Okay, your PSA is high. You have a choice. You want it to be from a big prostate, which is a completely harmless entity, or do you want it to be from prostate cancer? Mm. So so you can actually with that PSA density information start to make a determination as to where this high PSA is coming from: big gland, prostate cancer. Yeah. No, that's really well, that's really well said. And I also think it's interesting that most of, even after you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, most of the active surveillance protocols, I have never actually asked your opinion on it, but many of the active surveillance protocols really take into account PSA density in yes. terms of whether or not you stay on active surveillance. In other words, that little bit of information goes a long, long way, Dr. Schultz. <laughs> yeah, actually, the way we use PSA density in our uh, active surveillance crowd, because there's a third entity that causes high PSA called prostatitis. And this uh, is a real bane of the prostate oncologist situation. We're looking at PSA, we're doing the ratio between the size of the gland and the PSA. And then sometimes, it, you know, you, you, you've got a high PSA, higher than it should be. And you can't really explain it. This man has a small amount of three plus three. So what we do is we call it prostatitis, which is kind of a grab bag term for prostate inflammation. And uh, it's a fair assessment, but uh, it can be a little nerve wracking sometimes. So is this a situation where we come in and do the random biopsy just to be safe? Um, I think I, I, I've been greatly relieved with the advent of these new PSMA PET scans, which can cross check our MRI information and make sure that there's not an unsuspected prostate cancer lurking in another corner of the prostate or even outside the prostate, to be, it would be even worse. And so, uh, so that's often our fallback position. If we have someone on active surveillance, high PSA density, PSA is higher than we can explain with how big the prostate is, we'll often think about getting a PSMA PET scan and uh, make sure that we're not missing something. Mm. There it is. That's a good that's slide. Right. That's, that's yeah. a comp comprehensive overview. That's a classic Shoals Moyad moment. All right, so this cute little cartoon um, is still comes up. I have patients that are in their 40s and 50s, small amounts of uh, Gleason 6, the harmless variant of prostate cancer. And they're being told by their urologist that they have to have surgery because they're young. Uh, that there's, they're going to live so long that over a period of many years, a problem will develop and they better take care of it now while they're young. 
And uh, which is, I think, a rather ridiculous premise, because the reason we don't do treatment in any man with a harmless prostate cancer is it's nothing to do with their age. It has to do with the preservation of normal sexual and urinary function. So it's very hard to get out of jail free with the modern therapies. A lot of men end up paying a price for treatment, uh, difficulty getting erections, leaking urine, and these sorts of really, really heavy handed problems. So the it's actually the younger men, those that are sexually active, that benefit the most by uh, postponing treatment. They're, they're the ones that are, are, uh, have the greatest loss of quality of life if they go through immediate therapy. And mm. so, uh, so I think that the, uh, the argument that just because someone is younger, that, that they should somehow take precautions uh, is, uh, has no foundation in science. We've shown that active surveillance is safe. There've been studies uh, comparing long-term cancer outcomes in people that have immediate treatment compared to those that postpone treatment. And if, if they undergo therapy at a later date because a new cancer comes along, for example, uh, that they have the same exact survival rates over the next 10, to 10 or more years. So, so the, being younger is not an argument to jump into treatment. Yeah, no, that's well said. That's part of the premise of your book invasion of the prostate snatchers in my book that's coming out soon and called invasion of the prostate radiators. <laughs> <laughs> no, but your point, your point is we, we still live, we still live in this era where there are many men, too many men being uh, overdiagnosed. They're being, they're being overdiagnosed with cancers that can't do harm. And then we still live in another area, which we'll talk about maybe later on, or maybe in a different talk, where the people that have very aggressive disease aren't getting aggressive enough treatment, right? Is that, is that well yeah. said? We, so it's I always call it the tale of two cities. Yes, that happens. So, so oftentimes when I'm in the office and we're talking about and we get our prostate cancer ducks lined up and uh, whether we're watching people or treating people, and then I'll just come out of the blue with a, a comment about, have you had your heart checked. And uh, sometimes people think that's a little out of place. You're a prostate doctor, you know, Dr. Schultz, uh, you know, where are you coming from? You're, uh, I don't understand this. And it really just comes down to statistics. The mortality rates from all prostate cancers are very, very low. And the, as we've mentioned before, the mortality rates from undiagnosed coronary artery disease is quite high in our age group. So uh, so it's just a good policy to bring up this uh, point of uh, the risk of dying of other causes that are preventable. We're not talking about trying to, uh, you know, forestall uh, death rates from things that we really can't do anything about. What we want to do is bring attention to the things that we can do things about. So, um, so that's the, um, so, let, so let's work backwards then from the types of things that cause male mortality. And uh, it's pretty simple. And I think most of us already understand this, but when you look at the numbers, they're rather shocking. So you go about halfway down the page, you can see that about, this is an older slide, it's probably down to about 25,000 men a year now that are dying of prostate cancer. But compare that to these other causes of death, um, it's such as heart disease, strokes, lung cancers, uh, these sorts of, uh, of uh, deaths, many of which are preventable, are going to be much more responsive if we can do something to screen for them and, and take action. So we're gonna go through briefly each of these different uh, uh, ways of finding cardiovascular disease. Historically, people have put people on uh, stress tests to try and see if they're, you know, they'll put monitors on their chest and see if there's oxygen starvation of the, um, of the myocardium. But that only picks up really advanced coronary artery disease that's starting to pinch down on the coronary arteries. We don't want to pick up people when they're you know, at the end of the road. We want to pick it up early because we know that there's things that we can do about it. We also have relied, I think, too heavily on just looking at cholesterol levels. Cholesterol levels are easy and convenient, and they give you a rough population sense of who's likely to have a lot of plaque and who's less likely to have a lot of plaque. But why are we guessing about how much plaque is there? Well, just, well, your family history, your blood pressure, your risks aren't that great of dropping dead suddenly. So we'll just ignore it. It's like, uh, wait a minute. If I'm in that 
three or four percent that suddenly drops dead and it could have been prevented by just getting uh, some uh, simple screening. Uh, does that make sense? So just because things are low likely doesn't mean they're unimportant when it could mean that you could have you know, a, a, a fatal uh, heart attack. You know, you're so right. Here's a statistic that not many people realize, and it could have changed slightly, but it's still roughly the same, that one out of every two cardiac events still occur in people that have quote unquote normal cholesterol. And so what we've done is we've given cholesterol a free pass. And we've said it's going to be the end all be all. It's going to predict everything. Well, we have no tests like that. Look how we handle PSA, right? Look how you handle PSA, which, which means PSA is a great test. It's been, it's so good. It stood the test of time. Cholesterol is a great test, but it's only a piece of the puzzle. And you, many of you, many of you out there need multiple pieces to see what your picture looks like. You can't just rely on one piece of the puzzle. And so right. what, what you're going to talk about in a minute are things that we undergo ourselves and we get done ourselves. And we're going to talk about that. But, you know, you gave me this analogy of a guy who has a, a low risk prostate cancer is taking his car and he's going into the mechanic and he's got a problem with his radio. OK. And he says, hey, I have a real problem with my radio. Can you fix this? I bought my car here. And then the guy goes, no problem. And then the guy comes back and he says, I fixed your car. And you know what? You need to come back in another hour or two because basically you have no brakes. And so you have no brakes and there's no way to stop the car. And it's as if the guy looks at the mechanic and goes, hey, I just brought this here from my radio. You're not going to touch my brakes. You know, that's <laughs> that's my analogy, right? I mean, you, you, you have to realize what else is out there. If you have low-risk prostate cancer, what else is out there? What, is, what else on the car could really cause your demise or be a problem? And so this is where we enter the part, which I like with you. It comes with pluses and minuses where you get a lot of these scans and you're a big fan of these scans. So let's move to the next slide. Let's look at these other pieces of the puzzle besides cholesterol, but please to the men out there, you have got to know your cholesterol numbers. You have got to know your HDL. You've got to know your LDL. You've got to know your triglycerides. You've got to know your total cholesterol. And you need to know those numbers as well as your PSA. I, I, Dr. Scholes is not going to remember this, but when I visited his clinic long ago, 15 years ago, I remember we were talking and we were kind of commenting about, hey, I said, you should do a study whereby the guy who comes in that knows every single PSA value by heart, you know, 2.589, you know, or whatever, 3.25. I said, after that person reels off all their numbers over the past 10 years, ask them what their last LDL was. And I bet you nine times out of 10, they can't tell you. Yep. And so that's kind of what we're talking about. And a lot of that is, on the educator. Well, yeah, why don't you put it in context? So we know that uh, supposedly, you know, we, we debunked the whole PSA of four as normal, but everyone knows that higher is worse, lower is, lower is yeah. better in general. Um, LDL cholesterols. Uh, I don't think people realize if you're going to look at anything in this cholesterol profile, you mentioned total HDL, which we really can't change very much. The LDL right. cholesterol is the, the one alterable risk factor. And yeah. so the heart doctors told me that if you're, if you've had a history of heart disease, they want to treat you with statins or Repatha or diet or whatever, and get your LDL cholesterol down around maybe 50 or 60 range, which if you're a normal American, and let's say you eat a reasonably good diet, you're looking at an LDL probably that averages around 120. That's right. Twice as, twice as high as optimal. Right. So, so the, the cardiovascular world is saying, well, we'll wait until you almost die of a heart attack. Then we'll get serious about this LDL. Yeah. Uh, well, that, that just doesn't make sense to me. So, uh, so I think you're right. People do need to know their numbers. And I would focus on the LDL. And I would ask my heart doctor or my family doctor, why aren't we trying to get my LDL down to optimal levels? If I had a heart scan that showed absolutely no plaque, then I would say, okay, maybe the LDL isn't as relevant because it's not sticking to the arterial walls. But 80 plus percent of men in our age group have, have measurable plaque on our coronary arteries. That's right. And, and you brought up a really good point because I've known a lot of cardiologists in my time, a lot. And I can tell you 
that I've heard lectures from them, I've given lectures to them. And I, I will tell you that if anyone ever commissions this study of specialists, anybody, by far and away, the cardiologists are the skinniest group of doctors I have ever met. And they all <laughs> tend to be carrying LDLs of around 50 to 70. And I'm going, gee, I wonder why that is. Are they just <laughs> genetically predispositioned to be skinny because they, they declare themselves to be cardiologists? No, they understand preventive medicine better than any specialty because for the last hundred years in a row, cardiovascular disease has been the number one cause of death. They're the ones who did the initial studies on diet, lifestyle, exercise. And what they're saying is ultimately, I don't want the treatments that I give in terms of invasive. If I have to do an yep. invasive procedure, they're amazing. Cabbage is amazing. Angioplasty can be amazing. But ultimately, I've my theory has always been that the cardiologists as a physician group are the skinniest in general. And mm -hmm. the other thing is they, they carry the lowest cholesterols because they have the inside information as to what it takes to live potentially a longer life. And, and not have to have stents put in, not to have to have angiograms not have to have heart attacks, not have to have strokes. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, they're, they're, um, they have insider knowledge, just as they you have, said. That, that's exactly right. They have insider knowledge. And, and just, we should be watching them as a group. And when I was early in my career, 20, 25 years ago, all the best lifestyle papers on how diet can change things and exercise came from the cardiology meetings. And now they come from all the meetings. So yep. I think that's a really important point. One other thing I do wanna bring up though on the cholesterol test, triglycerides is now starting to have an, a more important role only because I, this is just my brother, it's less, less than 150 is supposed to be normal, but we know metabolically, if you can have a triglyceride, which is a hundred or less, then metabolically it identifies a more healthy individual slash patient. So triglycerides are playing more and more of a role. And it's one of the things, you know, when men get treated with hormonal therapy for prostate cancer and they gain weight, those numbers, triglycerides can shoot up, right? So if you're one of these guys who has a low bad cholesterol, but you're, you have high triglycerides hanging out up here, you still got to do something about it. But I couldn't agree more with Dr. Scholes. LDL is king of the blood test. Triglycerides are important. HDL is important, but you, you generally elevate that by lifestyle change and follow the cardiologist. They got I, the I really, inside information. I really appreciate your, your uh, asking our listeners to know their LDL levels, know their triglyceride levels. Um, one of the things that served really well with this scan is, uh, you know, the whole atherosclerosis problem is a silent issue until something goes pop. And, and so it's kind of an abstraction and I've got enough problems. I got bills to pay. I've got doctor visits. I've got a job to go to. And now you want me to start looking for heart problems with this heart yeah. scan thing. Um, so it's, it, it, but the issue is I have seen is that when p men do get these heart scans and they can see it, oh my gosh, I've got the same amount of plaque. Let's say this is a 60 year old man. And they say, because they put you on a profile and say, you've got the same amount of plaque as the average 70 year old man. Mm -hmm. said, oh my gosh, this is, this is very motivating for patients. This, mm -hmm. uh, okay, all right, I will take that cholesterol pill. I'll go see the cardiologist. I'll go get screened. I'll change my lifestyle because it's a, very, it's a visual that um, is much, it's not an abstraction of I've got a high cholesterol and maybe I'll die of a heart attack in the by and by and you know, you know, yeah, but it's, it, it seems to motivate people. No, that's a really good point. And you know, when you get one of these, even if you get another one years down the road, it's like anything else. You have a baseline, right? Yeah. Is exactly right. Did what you you're saying. Did you stop the process? Absolutely. Were you, yeah. were you successful? Did you, let's say you are a 60 year old with a 70 year old plaque and you check it again in three to five years. Did you hold your own or is it just yeah. continuing to march on? Yeah. So, so anyway, that, that has been very useful for me in the, and uh, this is a actual, this is an older scan, but you can see the difference between someone on the left that didn't have any plaque and how it brightly lights up in someone that has a lot of calcified plaque on a, yeah. on a cat. It's not ambiguous. It's very straightforward. So, um, so we've kind of covered this people that have zero plaque, of course, um, are can go out and celebrate by eating Twinkies and ice cream. Apparently they, they, uh, they have fab fabulous metabolic rates. And, um, I think my mom inherited this or HDL is like a hundred. And, uh, and so some people, 
are just metabolically blessed, but they're That's not right. that common. Most of us, most of us are are uh, are at risk for this. So, uh, who should get these tests? Uh, just about most men, and we should start younger than you think because people uh, can men can have heart attacks in their 30s and 40s. It's uh, and this is a preventable disaster. So, so um, sorry, I keep I, I I actually ended up liking your slides much more than I realized. I like them. I know you wrote them a while ago, and I know you've got a bunch of them, that, but they keep making me think. Oh, uh, with, my, with, with, <laughs> with Dr. Miner, there's two points I want to make from your slides, which are very important. One is, remember we said that the LDL is just one piece of the puzzle. And when you're talking about the CT uh, coronary calcium score, it's just another piece of the puzzle, right? It, it, right. If you qualify for it, it's become cheaper. It's another piece of the puzzle. A, a, a misunderstanding, which we talked about earlier, is that just because you have a good cholesterol, you're protected from heart disease. And we explained that 50% of the heart attacks occur with people who have good, good cholesterol numbers, but cholesterol still is one of the most important blood tests ever invented. Another misunderstanding, and you probably run into this all the time, is that people think of coronary artery disease is this thing that kind of builds up over time. It's like a pipe in your house and it gets clogged and more clogged and more clogged and then it's fully clogged and then it bursts and the game over. Wrong. What yep. if you talk to the cardiologist, what we were surprised to learn in our careers is the a lot of the high risk come from the ones that just carry a little bit of calcium or a little bit of plaque. And those are the ones that break open, right? And then they initiate an occlusive reaction, right? So yep. it's not your it's not your father's or your grandfather's way of thinking of how your pipes get clogged, where they get 100% clogged, and then you run into symptoms. A lot of what they're dealing with today, and especially on women's health, is you have very small lesions, and those are unstable, and yep. their instability is what creates the danger because they break off or they crack. And when that happens, the body suddenly rushes. And then it, you have this coagulation cascade, we call it. And that's what creates the occlusion. So what people don't understand about controlling your cholesterol and all these other things and, and exercising is for people who have those very small, volatile, dangerous plaques, it helps keep them stable. It helps keep them where they are so they don't break off. And that's what we've learned in the past few years about, for example, the cholesterol lowering medications, that one of the things that does really well is it takes those really dangerous tiny plaques and basically says, you sit right there, you don't move, you're not yep. going to crack. And, and, and it's, so it's, a, it's an incredibly fascinating time in cardiovascular medicine. The other thing I'll tell you when this slide makes me think of, and you can comment to this too, is that there are still too many people that go in and they get a, a fasting blood sugar and their fasting blood sugar can be high, low, or medium. But there's a test that was done in diabetics forever, and now it's being pushed more toward people who don't have diabetes, and that's called hemoglobin A1C, right? So hemoglobin A1C gives you about a three month, two to three month overview of what your average uh, blood sugar can be. So what you made me think of when I saw this slide immediately is more men walk, watching this cannot be satisfied with just a fasting blood sugar. They need to say to their doctor, can I also get a hemoglobin A1C? I've seen you pull them on a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, well, if you think about it, probably diabetes, all these things on the list here in the slide are, are uh, risk factors for more and more plaque. Yes. And, uh, and if you're gonna be looking for things, why not use the most accurate test? The, uh, the fasting blood sugars, bounce around and you'll, you'll see that when you do them frequently. The hemoglobin A1C will give you a real sense. Are you running around with blood sugars chronically elevated? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And then when even when I look at the other one, all of these have messages, right? All of these contribute to unstable plaques. All of these are associated with higher risks of even some cancers. And so there's plenty of reason to bring these all under control. High blood pressure is one of my favorite to talk about. I don't know if you know this. I thought maybe you know everything about me, but maybe you don't. So let me tell you one of my favorite things to talk about. One of my favorite things to talk about is you talk to someone. I mean, I used to have a consulting clinic. Now I just do education for PCRI. But one of my favorite things to talk about on the phone and with other people is that they'll go in once a year 
they'll get a blood pressure and they'll go, well, the doctor said it's normal. And I'm going, <laughs> wait a second. That is a, a, a one second snapshot that many times blood pressure readings in this country can be wrong because so many things affect blood pressure. It is really smart today to carry your own blood pressure cuff monitor system at home and take it yep. many times throughout the year and then bring yep. that diary in to your physician and say, see if those numbers line up. So yep. 2022 was a big moment in cardiology. One of the larger studies and meta-analyses showed that when patients take their blood pressure frequently at home, it seems to be as accurate, if not more accurate than getting it done in the office. Yep. Well, that Sorry. makes sense because people, people come to the office and they're stressed out. That's they're, right. They're, they're going to be seeing the uh, physician. That's and, right. I mean, again, common sense. We have a lot of engineers that, that uh, follow the PCRI. And if you're running a uh, pressurized system 24 hours a day, which is your, your blood system is a pressurized system, and you're running it at a higher pressure than necessary, all you're doing is creating unnecessary wear and tear on the, on the vascular system. And you can't replace your vascular system. You get one vascular system. And as long as it lasts, that's as long as you last. That's so right. So if, if, right. if there's a choice, we want to try and keep the blood pressure on the low side of normal, not just normal. That's Even keep right. it on the low side of normal. That's right. You keep it. And, you know, so I give you this analogy I give to people all the time. If I invite Dr. Scholes over to my house to a party and it's really hot outside and then I have a hose, a water hose, and he says, I'm hot, you know, just let me let me drink out of the water hose. And I put a water hose here and then I decide later on that day, I'm going to trick him. I'm going to put out a fire hose. And I'm going to instead crank up the pressure. He wouldn't be able to stand up if it hit his face, his body, his legs. The pressure of that water or that system would knock him over and damage him. And what people need to understand, what we've learned about high blood pressure and hypertension now in 2022, is it literally destroys everything in its path. It destroys the sexual organs, it destroys the kidneys, it destroys the heart, and the big surprise of 2022 is it destroys the brain. So now it's being associated with higher rates of dementia. So people have looked at high blood pressure for the longest time as a cardiovascular issue, when from head to toe, that amount of pressure, which you're talking about, destroys everything in its path or damages it, and that's how you have to look at it. Yeah, it is so treatable, and you have to start by getting the accurate information. You could argue that if you're if people aren't checking their blood pressure at home, maybe they're seeing doctors frequently, it's not necessary. But the blood pressure that you have during your normal everyday living is your real blood pressure. When you get out to a doctor's office, that's an artificial situation. You're not there very often, and people may run higher or lower. Uh, so checking it at home, I think it's great advice. Let's go on. Uh, you're a public health expert, uh, and the, you know, we've had so much talk about vaccines over the last couple of years with the whole COVID uh, yeah. issues. I, one of the things that I go out of my way to mention, even though it's not part of the prostate cancer uh, uh, you know, thing that we do, is the value of uh, shingles vaccines. Most people have been exposed uh, to uh, the um, zoster virus at some point in their lives, and they're the lifetime risk I'm told is about one out of three of us will get shingles at some point. And the new shingles vaccine, the older Zosta vac uh, vaccine had some value, but it wasn't that great. But the new one I understand is incredibly efficacious. And you can pretty much guarantee that you'll never get shingles if you're willing to get a vaccine. I, I, I'm so glad you brought this slide up for a million reasons. And I know we don't have time to cover the million reasons, but for those of you who are bored, and you want to go to PubMed and type in Moyad. The last two or three articles I've written cover vaccines. Most of them are free. They're open to the public because of a government grants made them open to the public. I, we, I just didn't talk about the importance of COVID vaccines, but all these vaccines. And I don't even know where to begin, Dr. Scholes, because I could literally give an eight-hour lecture on each one of them. So you want to talk about the, the shingles vaccine first a little bit? I know you talked about it. I think that's I think that's the biggest value added. Flu vaccines, I think, makes sense because yep. in yep. in an aging population, but we do have Tamiflu, yeah, and yep. Uh, and so that has uh, uh, 
it's really a remarkable antibiotic, greatly underutilized. I can't tell you how often I have people when, you know, we sit down at, at the exam table and I say, how's your health? And say, oh, I'm doing great, Dr. Scholes. I got a terrible flu last month. And of course, part something inside of me cringes because I, if, the, if they thought to call me, I could have called some Tamiflu in and it usually ends the symptoms within 24 to 48 hours. It's very effective. I know. So let's start at the one at the top. This is this is the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night and keep and keep me and kept me from getting in the good schools when I was applying for them. I would just think about this stuff constantly. So you mentioned Tamiflu, and now we have this new one called Paxlovid that comes from Pfizer for COVID. And so time is time is your enemy. The longer you're running around these symptoms, the earlier you can get to these symptoms with Tamiflu. Because remember, Paxlovid is basically the first five days. Tamiflu, you want to get it in the first 48 hours. And if you yep. can get it in the first 12 to 24, it can be the difference between a really ugly situation and a really good situation. We also have a new one coming out now that's gaining a lot of attention called Zofluza. It's X-O-F-L-U-Z-A. And it looks like head to head, it's as good as Tamiflu, but you just take it. It's, it's one dose, one time, and you're done. You don't have to keep wow. taking it for days. So, so what's happening here is I do wish they would call you more because so many people still get the flu. They have miserable symptoms that last for weeks, but if they catch it in those first 24 to 48 hours, just like with COVID or another situation, they call you and you can get that. That can be the difference between still going out and having a nice vacation or being miserable for the next few weeks and even life-threatening. So I'm just so glad that you brought up the antiviral and the fact that you should get your flu vaccine. So why, why don't you talk? Yes. No. Why don't you talk briefly? Cause there's probably some people that haven't heard about Paxlovid, which is a mind blowing uh, advance and I, probably most have, but it would be terrible if someone hadn't. So why don't you mention that just briefly? Well, so, you know, the, the, the goal is if you can find an antiviral, so because you know, everybody, Look at, I, I'm not here to preach. I think my idea is there's just, my, I was put in this role to tell you pros and cons. I, I have found that these vaccines are just one of the greatest success stories in human history, but they don't make, they don't make a, a whole lot of money in the sense, and they don't get a lot of fanfare. Prevention, you know, if you never get something, how can that be worthwhile? How can you prove to me it does something, right? Well, if I live to be 90 or 95, you know, that seems to make a difference. And so not getting something is associated with robustness. So I just want to first say that if people really understood the vaccines, which ones were effective, they would be amazed. So, but even when you have an effective vaccine, it does two things for you. A lot of people still can get the uh, virus or they can still get the condition and they say, well, the vaccine didn't work. That's not true. One of the greatest success stories of the vaccines is even when you get it, it keeps you from going into the hospital. So it reduces your severity. And that was the yep. success of the COVID vaccines. Look, people still all the time say to me, I still got COVID. And I go, but yeah, but you weren't hospitalized. You weren't on a ventilator. And so one of the greatest success stories is it keeps a mild, moderate case from becoming a severe hospitalized ventilation case or life-threatening case. And that's true of the flu. So many people don't realize that the flu vaccine keeps you from being hospitalized for the flu even when you get it. Still though, you could be high risk. You could be going under cancer treatment. You, as you get older, you become higher risk with comorbid conditions, with weight gain, with diabetes, high risk. So you wanna have an antiviral that when you are diagnosed in the early stages, you can take. So most people know Tamiflu, but they still, I will tell you most people, I couldn't agree with you more, don't call their doctors and say, hey, can I get this script if I qualify? And if you do qualify, the people, doctors are happy to write for it. So along comes this antiviral from Pfizer. No, I don't speak for Pfizer. I don't work for Pfizer. I basically don't work with any of these companies. And they developed this thing called Paxlovid. And Paxlovid, you take twice a day for five days. And the amount, even in the unvaccinated, that it reduced the risk of a mild, moderate case from becoming severe was nothing less than extraordinary. It's so mind-blowing that we could spend an hour going, this is an incredible invention. And it doesn't look like, at least in the early stages, it's increasing the risk of resistance, and it's still able to go after all of these variants, right? 
But the biggest problem I see is that people will diagnose themselves at home with an Abbott test, for example, a Binax now. And these rapid tests have been amazing. I have five here next to the desk. I've got, I carry them wherever I go and I travel. I think if people understood how good this antiviral could be for them, I have now started telling my friends that if I were you, I would not travel in this or any other country, especially I wouldn't leave to go to another country without some backup antiviral. Because if you're stuck on some island someplace vacationing or somewhere else, or even if you think you have a mild case that starts progressing, you need to get on the phone and ask for Paxlovid. So it is the, it is the Tamiflu answer to COVID-19. But let me tell you, statistically, clinically, you could argue it, it's far better in terms of efficacy. I mean, it's a real home run for the people that potentially qualify. And what's been incredible is people go after all this toxicity, but when you really look at the rate of side effects versus placebo, it's not that much more than placebo. And then you have a very small percentage of what we call rebound cases and people make a big deal out of it, but it's been such a tiny percentage of rebound. And then almost all those cases of rebound, the, the patient still doesn't advance to severe to life-threatening disease. So it's still holding COVID back. And so I don't know if that covered enough of it, but the biggest, concern with, the biggest concern with Paxlovid is people aren't calling their doctors to get it, number one. And number two is the biggest concern you should be concerned about as a consumer when you get it is just to check about the drug interactions because there's an extensive list of drug interactions. But many of these just mean you need to stop your drug while you're taking that short course. So what you should do is your homework on the drug interactions and do your homework as who do I call if I get ill? Because its ability like the vaccines to protect a mild and moderate case to become a life-threatening case is unbelievable. I'll tell you a quick story. I have to go to the Canadian Neurologic Association meeting. So I got to travel in the middle of nowhere in Canada. It's a beautiful area. I've already called ahead and made sure that that was an area that, got, <laughs> that has Paxlovid. Because I'm not traveling anywhere during this pandemic, which has now killed more than a million people. I'm not traveling anymore unless I know about the availability of Paxlovid where I'm going. That's how important it is right now in the discussion, apart from vaccines, which I'm a big fan of also in boosters. So sorry. It's, but you it's, No, no, no. I think that's so apropos. And it's really what the PCR is about is to wave the flag for the technologies that we believe that we yeah. put at the PCRI after consideration and thought believe that will become mainstream standard treatment and uh, based on the preliminary research that we have in front of us. So there's always yes. a calculated yeah. risk with anything new, but boy, the evidence is heavily in favor of um, Paxlovid reducing the risk of you being harmed rather than increasing the risk of you being harmed. That's and right. It's, uh, and it's available and, it's, uh, and it is tolerable. And, and so it, I think it's very apropos for us to be talking about that. It is. And if you, and if you want the con side, the con side, because people always, well, well, you guys sell for these. I, like I said, I don't work with them at all. I'm just telling you, I'm somebody who has an epidemiology, biostatistical background. The numbers I'm seeing are just, they're unbelievable, at least for now. Maybe you do get resistance in the future. They're really unbelievable. But I want to leave you with another thought that never gets any attention. See, I'm of the, I'm of the camp that we have underestimated the damage that these diseases have done. And the reason I know we've underestimated it was that people aren't associating these diseases, these infectious diseases, with inflammation. If you go on TV and you say something causes inflammation, everyone goes, whoa. Inflammation, I know that word, like that's become the buzzword of our generation, Dr. Scholz. If you say something causes inflammation, wow, you can sell it, you can talk about it, you have someone's attention. So let's do that. What people have not associated in their brains, which again, I think part of it is our fault in public health. We should be doing a better job of educating. Any of these infections, whether it's the flu, whether it is uh, shingles, whether it's pneumonia, whether it's COVID-19, all of them when you're infected cause an inflammatory reaction. And as the disease becomes more severe, so does the inflammatory reaction. So what's happening is 
that these respiratory diseases we've learned in 2022 are not just respiratory diseases, they're cardiovascular diseases because they trigger clotting events. They trigger myocardial infarctions. They trigger strokes. So what we're starting to see now are people that get their vaccinations done have a lower risk of having, in some cases, a heart attack, a stroke, a blood clot. And so if you look at the statistics in America, it wasn't just over a million people dying from COVID, is that you saw this bump in this increase in cardiovascular events. And I am telling you, if you follow that data out, you'll see that a lot of these infections caused inflammatory events, which down the road, maybe it was a month, two, three months later, triggered a cardiovascular event. And then the doctor said, well, that person had a heart attack. But what they don't realize is that heart attack or stroke or situation could have actually been initially triggered by that inflammatory event from having a severe case of COVID, right? So yep. I, I have friends who had arrhythmias with COVID. They still have arrhythmias. They're still on medication. I just wish these infectious diseases would be linked with cardiovascular disease. And I think then more of us would run out and realize what we call the pleiotropic effects the multiple effects that these kind of uh, preventive vaccines play, which is why I'm always one of the first to get them having seen the data. Now, I'm also very skeptical in the sense that I understand that Pfizer has Paxlovid, which is really good. And then there's a competitive antiviral, which the data is not that great, but Pfizer's data on its antiviral for COVID is really good. So that has got to be the number one choice public health wise for an antiviral. I, I won't go on forever, but you really <laughs> struck a nerve. And speaking of striking a nerve, let's talk about shingles. Let's mm -hmm. talk about how incredible Shingrix is. You get two injections. You get one and then you have to come back two to six months later and get the second one. Now, there is uh, talk amongst the consumer groups and the public that that vaccine really hurts. It causes pain temporary. And, and for some people, that's true. But you have to understand why that is. The reason Shingrix is so effective is it has an adjuvant that really has never been used before that's so potent, it takes this regular vaccine and basically turns it into this mega effective vaccine by having an adjuvant, which basically means they find another piece of material, hook it to that injection, and then that creates a really big immune boost. And that actual adjuvant comes from Chile, from what's called the soap bark tree. So when people tell me that some vaccines aren't natural, that's not true. Because if you wanna play this natural game with me, Shingrix has an adjuvant that has been a total game changer in the vaccine world. It's such a game changer that almost all the other companies that I'm following want to get their hands on this adjuvant and they want to license it because it makes their vaccines work so much better. The other thing that a really good adjuvant does means you have to use less material for your vaccine so then you can get more material out there. You get more bang for your buck so you can get more of the population can be um, can get the vaccine quickly because you don't have to generate a lot of material for the vaccine because the adjuvant works so well. So all I'm trying to tell you is when you have a vaccine that's starting at the age of 50, 60, 70, 80, that can not only reduce your risk of shingles by upwards to 90% plus, you've got one of the greatest Nobel Prize winning stories out there and they're not going to get a Nobel Prize, which they should, and they're going to be one of the greatest um, stories in medicine that doesn't get a Nobel Prize because they're basically reducing the risk of getting shingles, post herpetic neuralgia, which is debilitating nerve pain that can last for years, and you're put on medication. I'll tell you what we're also seeing a lot of in the public health world is what we call HZO, ophthalmicus. So you're getting basically uh, shingles of the eye, and shingles of the eye can cause blindness. And actually, one of the biggest campaigners for getting Shingrix and shingles vaccine is a physician that got shingles of the eye. And so mm -hmm. it's really debilitating. Right now, the big story in the young population is Justin Bieber. Justin Bieber got a syndrome where half his face is paralyzed. And right now, if all the media is accurate and the medical behind it, that's basically also caused from the shingles virus, the chickenpox virus, this Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. So 
shingles does a lot more than just cause this dermatone pattern, you know, this painful type rash like look. It can go in the eyes. It can work its way into blood vessels. It can do a lot of damage. And we've got this incredible vaccine that's still not enough people. Here, here was the statistic I used in my last paper. Do you realize in my age group, and you, we're not that close apart, but your age group too, the, the average uptake of adult vaccinations is 25 to about 50%. It's it just it just makes that's no what, sense. That's so why I, we're that's why we're talking about it. That's is why the, we're here. This is this is the low lying fruit in terms of you can change people's futures that's with some right. fairly simple measures. I have a close friend, somehow or another, he didn't get his shingles vaccine. He's been in constant, unremitting pain now for nine months, and they haven't found a solution. You know, they try nerve blocks, they try yes. gabapentin, they try. And it literally has ruined his life and there's no end in sight. That's and this, right. was all pre this was all preventable if he'd had, a sim and of course he feels dreadful now. He knows he should have been vaccinated and uh, he feels guilty about that because it, it has basically taken away his life. I have so many friends and know so many people through the years that's the exact same. They're two, three, four years out and they're on all these pain medications. And then, you know, they can become dependent on those medications and they get loopy on those but yep. they just have this debilitating nerve pain. And, you know, and, and how many more people, what the other thing that happens is when it infects the eye, for example, is it accelerates eye disease that already exists, but can accelerate a cataract, can accelerate all sorts of different eye, eye diseases. And so it's just wreaks havoc. It's really an ugly, ugly, awful virus when it reappears. And now it's being associated uh, with a lower risk of stroke and cardiac events for people who, who get these type of vaccines. And that's, I just wish, I, I'm so glad you told me that story about your friend because there's just so much of it out there and we finally have a potential answer. And I don't think people realize the potential benefit across the board. I just don't think they've come to the realization and it's a recombinant vaccine. So what you talked about earlier is we used to have a live attenuated one. So you have to be very careful to give a live vaccine to people who are vulnerable. You know, this one is getting approved across the board, you know, oncology, all these other places because it has such a good track record of efficacy as well as safety long-term, which is really awesome, really awesome. So I'm really glad that you brought that up. All right, let me see. We're gonna close now to talk just a little bit about fitness. This has come up many, many times in our um, discussions at the PCRI because in men that are testosterone deprived, we always try and help them build muscle mass to counteract the negative effects of Lupron and, and uh, Firmagon and these sorts of things. But for people that are maybe don't have prostate cancer, may never need any type of hormone therapy, uh, the, the absence of fitness is, uh, is kind of, it's another kind of a silent problem that that translates into very serious implications for longevity and for quality of life. In fact, it's just as serious being unfit as some of these common problems that we think of as uh, very serious health problems. So the, the, this uh, article from the New England Journal of Medicine, some maybe 20 years ago now, uh, was done by a cardiologist in New York who had huge practice. And he would put people on a treadmill and they, they would gauge how fit you are by how long you could last on the, on the treadmill. They call them metabolic equivalents, but you can see on these curves, and I always hate to show curves, but it's so stark, how when he tried to look into the social security database 10 years later to find out who was collecting a check, one good indication of whether you're alive or dead, he found that the people that 10 years earlier that performed poorly on a stress test, that was the less than five metabolic equivalent capacity, had only a 60% 10 year survival. These are otherwise healthy people with no known medical problems. Those that were in the, in the uh, top fitness uh, category, 90% of them were alive. So this is a, a, a very stark indication of how powerful fitness is in terms of improving longevity and of course quality of life which is not included in this study but we all know that we feel better when we when we're fit yeah uh this was a i, I know well it's a brilliant study uh 
equally brilliant that got no attention was because of the center was Cle Cleveland Clinic did a study of, they decided to look at all their exercise treadmill tests consecutively. They looked at thousands upon thousands upon tens of thousands and they found the exact same thing. They found that when they, they put people on exercise treadmill test and then they look 10, 20, 30 years later, regardless if you were 80, 90, 50, 40, even the 20 year olds, they could look at the curves and predict based, their, they first, based on their cardiovascular fitness, they could predict all cause mortality pretty well. And so yep. it's, it's, I find it amazing that the number one heart center in the world, basically just like this study, um, probably came up with the strongest amount of evidence that if you can maintain your cardio uh, respiratory fitness or cardiovascular fitness too, that it's one of the greatest predictors that you can do well long-term. But, you know, they're known for their treatments, right? They're known for their bypasses and their angioplasties and their meds. But I give kudos to these same organizations that are basically saying, hey, th the more fit you can remain regardless of age, it predicts longevity. And that is awesome. I really like this slide a lot. Yeah. All right. So with that, Mark, I think... Um... We should probably move on to talking about Dr. Miner's many fascinating, um, uh, you know, all the information that he provided us with. Uh, okay. In particular, it comes up all the time in my world about the use of testosterone in men that have had prostate cancer in the past. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so we, surprisingly, um, are treating scores and scores of men that have had prostate cancer with testosterone for varying reasons. And, uh, and we're not uh, in any way ashamed of that. And of course there are uh, right and wrong ways to monitor people to make sure that you don't get into trouble. I'm more concerned about uh, testosterone not flaring up prostate cancer because we, we, we select people carefully and we monitor them closely. I'm more concerned about the cardiovascular implications of people that go on testosterone and who aren't monitored closely for the development of polycythemia. Mm. Uh, people always know what anemia is, mm. but they, if you mention the word polycythemia, this is like, huh, you know, that no one's really ever heard of that. But polycythemia is basically the opposite of anemia. So anemia means low red blood cells. And then of course, if there's a normal amount of red cells, polycythemia means that some men taking testosterone make excess red cells, which if you're trying to run a marathon is fantastic, but you're pumping thicker blood and that puts greater strain on the cardiovascular system, and it can indeed cause heart attacks and strokes. Uh, so, uh, so there's uh, it's very important to uh, emphasize that while we use testosterone judiciously in our, uh, even in men that have had prostate cancer, even men that have existing prostate cancers that are low grade, um, we always watch the PSA and whatnot, but we watch much more closely the hematocrit. That's the mm. The, the measure of, of red cells, whether someone's anemic, normal, or polycythemic. No, really, really well put. I, you know, everything likes to play in this middle ground. You know, I always, I always go back to your first slide. You know, you don't want to, over analysis leads to paralysis. You don't, you don't want to just focus in on every little thing going on. You'll never live a quality life. At the same time, you don't want to let everything go, right? Everything plays in a middle ground testosterone plays in this in this area and then if you take all your testosterone away like androgen deprivation therapy and you have no testosterone then dr Scholes could diagnose you and often does diagnose you with a slight form of anemia right normal chromic normal cytic anemia so you need your testosterone to make red blood cells but then you got what you're describing is the opposite people get too much testosterone and they make way too many red blood cells and people always say to me all the time, is that a bad thing? And I think you described it well. And I always think of these analogies where, have you ever had a shake? You buy a shake. Not that I know that you eat anything unhealthy because you play tennis, you keep fit, and God forbid you eat anything unhealthy. But let's just pretend you go to a shake shack or a shake and you get a really thick shake, right? And let's say Scholes drinks the shake, but he can't bring the shake up in the straw because it's stuck. The actual material is too thick. It gets stuck yep. in the straw. So now imagine the straw as your blood vessel and that thick mm -hmm. shake is you getting too much testosterone. That's what happens. Mm -hmm. You have so many cells, they become packed and they get stuck in the straw. And basically now you're dealing with a cardiovascular problem. 
you're not yep. getting. More is not better. So I couldn't agree with you more, but I mean, how big, how big is, I mean, how do you even initiate that conversation today when someone has been cured of their prostate cancer for four or five years, their testosterone's really low. They have the symptoms of low testosterone. They say, you know what, Dr. Scholz, I want to try testosterone replacement therapy. I mean, where, it's such a oh, moving target. Where do you yeah, go? I, I, we're we're pretty excited about uh, restoring men back to normal uh, with their testosterone. And so part of the conversation uh, will be very similar to what you and I just discussed. And if necessary, we warn men, you may have to go down to the Red Cross and donate blood every, every six to eight weeks uh, to stay ahead of this because mm -hmm. testosterone can cause you to create dangerous excess amounts of red cells. And, uh, Usually the guys are so excited about getting testosterone that's, oh, sure, that's no problem. Um, and so the, uh, uh, you know, testosterone has this, this uh, powerful allure. Let me say one other thing about testosterone, apart from it's, uh, there's a lot of good things and we use it for that reason. Um, it seems that people focus too much on the, the absolute number of testosterone in their blood and they're not focusing on, well, why are we taking testosterone? Is it restoring energy levels? Is it building muscle mass? Is it enabling better blood sugar control? Is it uh, res resulting in uh, loss of fat? Um, is your mood better? Um, interestingly, a number of men that are walking around with say low normal or, or even slightly abnormally low testosterone levels, when you give them testosterone, they, not everyone feels like it's like the magic of, uh, you know, of heaven. Um, some people, yes. Some people are like, ah, I feel normal again. This is such a relief. And But others, um, they tolerate low testosterone very well, and it doesn't impact their quality of life that much. So, uh, so I think that this is uh, something to remind people that we're trying to restore quality of life. We're not trying to fix a number. Mm -hmm. And uh, that concept is very hard for people to wrap their brains around because they see a low testosterone, they want to get that number right. And I understand that goal, but if it's not translating into some measurable benefit, is it really worth the trouble? And maybe even there is a little bit of risk. Yeah, that's really well put. I used to, I didn't apply it to that. I, I'm trying to think where I came up, where I thought of this analogy. And I think it was, I think it, I know where it came from. In the old days when people would talk about eating a quality diet, people would get too caught up in the, in the minutia, you know, uh, you know, in terms of frozen microwave, what happens to the nutrients? I remember all these discussions and then I finally got so frustrated. It made me think of testosterone too. And, and what I meant by that was if you're sitting in tiger stadium or Los Angeles, Dodger stadium, right. And you can hit the ball over the home run fence, even just barely, if Shoals can do it, people go, wow, that's amazing. Okay. Now let's say that Shoals goes pump some iron. He does some other stuff. Maybe he takes some roids. I don't know. You come back in a few weeks and you don't just hit the ball 400 feet over the fence. This time you hit it 400 miles. You send it past Los Angeles and then people go, oh my God, that's just incredible. And then I have to unfortunately walk up to you and go, I'm sorry, that still just counts as one point. In other words, sometimes people think that what you're saying is exactly right. Sometimes think further, longer, better, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the distance that the, the number goes just means it's that much better when it comes to testosterone. They don't realize it still just counts as a point for many people. And then you start worrying about, you know, what's the ball going to hit someone in the face way far away, you know, is it dangerous? <laughs> you can see, so there really needs to be a dialogue between the, the treating doctor and the patient as to what are our goals for this? That's right. And uh, it, it, is this just because we, uh, we notice you have a low testosterone, which, you know, that creates anxiety in people's minds. Uh, but lowish testosterone historically, as people age, is, is, is a normal uh, component of aging. And, yes, exactly. uh, and so, so that is, and it's okay to say, no, I, I, I want to try and reverse my tiredness. My, uh, I, I feel a little bit of depression. I, I, I want to get better blood sugar control. I want to uh, get more muscle mass. Okay, those are all realistic goals. It's not about fixing the number. It's about right. having a, a concrete beneficial goal 
And, uh, and, it's, and that's the type of a dialogue that should be happening. If people are just fixing a number, I think they're chasing a phantasma. I don't, uh, I don't think that that's the right way of thinking. And, and it can be sometimes a little bit risky too. That's right. And it's going to change. I can tell you where it changed. is an endocrinology already in thyroid hormone it change. If you read guidelines and you now see all the experts, they say, you don't chase a thyroid number you want to get to youth thyroid, you want to, you want to take enough that, yeah, I could put you in a normal range, but you know, how do you feel? So even if yep. your thyroid's a little low or a little high, how do you feel? So now what's changed in the past 10 years is everybody talks about thyroid hormone plus how are you feeling? And so mm -hmm. I just wish what you're saying is so true. I just wish this would happen to testosterone. I'll tell you the other thing that nobody ever mentions about testosterone replacement enough is that if you take this for a long time, a long time, I used to always joke at, at events, I used to say, well, well, then one testicle starts talking to the other testicle and says, hey, you know, what the hell's going on here, right? I mean, I thought we're supposed to produce this. And the other guy says, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, but, but, you know, obviously they don't care about us anymore. So let's just shut this whole thing down, right? Let's just shut mm -hmm. this whole company down. So what you mm -hmm. still don't hear enough about is that the longer you give yourself exogenous or outside hormone, especially when you don't need it, the more likely long-term that you stop making it on your own permanently, mm -hmm. permanently. So you're dependent on the drug the rest of your life. And so where, where Marty and Minor and I talked a lot and we've had these exchanges, which have been good is that well, all, everything comes with a catch. Testosterone replacement comes with a catch. And what we're saying is you can have that discussion after prostate cancer treatment, but for goodness sakes, please have a discussion about the catches. Yeah. You like, you it's like that, you like that testicular talk. It was uh, the testicular, mm -hmm. but, but you know, it's true. Look what we've learned. We've learned the human body is an amazing machine. And if you start doing all the work for it, it recognizes that it doesn't have to work anymore. Yep. And you become completely dependent on the outside source. Yeah, this is probably something, you know, you get uh, younger people that are pursuing this with, for cosmetic reasons or vanity right. reasons. And uh, and that's that's kind of scary. My world, you know, these are mostly older men. Maybe they, yep. they were on Lupron and, and uh, Lupron can have some lingering effects or they're just getting older. And, that's uh, absolutely right. And it's right. Uh, so you're you're. Uh, but in the younger men who are trying to set new records, like you say, hit the ball 400 miles, um, they definitely um, can create havoc with their normal system. And they're well aware of that. Some of these, uh, you know, these bodybuilders and whatnot that are trying to, to do, you know, unusual things with their body. Um, and because uh, that's what you give excess cortisone, you give excess thyroid, you give excess testosterone. And the normal glands will shut down and they'll just coast. Right, exactly. And I don't want to downplay the patient population. You see, I'm not, this is a men's health conference. So we're dealing with men of all ages. There's no yep. question. There's another dark side of this, which is very difficult to watch. And you may want to comment on it. Someone has actually been on hormone therapy or androgen deprivation therapy for a long time. And then you feel comfortable and they come off and they're expecting their testosterone when they went on, they were say 450, 500, and they're expecting it to go back to 450, 500 again. And you really feel bad. You see this guy, it goes, it goes back to 125, maybe 150. I mean, you see this all the time. Do you want to comment yes. on this? They, they don't go back to where they were. And sometimes they don't even get close. Absolutely. And um, historically, there wasn't a whole lot that we could do about it. It was just price of admission. You know, we're curing cancer mm -hmm. and... Uh, and uh, this is sort of baked into a lot of the studies. So when they would give like 18 months of Lupron for high risk prostate cancer, and then, but the realizations it could take 24 to 30 months before they'd ever get their testosterone back. <clears throat> and did that contribute to better cure rates and all this whole thing. But now there is a new medicine out called Orgovix <laughs> that has more predictable recovery of testosterone when it's stopped. And so people do need to be aware of that in terms of um, uh, gauging how long do they wanna be stuck with a low testosterone. Um, it's not a big an issue in younger men. Most of them will bounce back nicely, but you get up into your late 60s and 70s, what you're describing is commonplace where yeah. maybe prior to treatment, their testosterones were running around 400 and now they're running around 200. Uh, and their medicine's all out of their system and the prostate cancer is behind them, they're cured. 
And uh, so these are men that historically we've had some conversations that maybe we need to give you some testosterone to get you back to just being normal again. So, uh, but the, uh, this Orgovix uh, oral uh, testosterone blocking agent doesn't seem to have the lingering effects that Lupron, Firmagon, Trellstar, Eligard, uh, and uh, Firmagon cause. And so uh, it is somewhat more expensive and it is, uh, and you know, some insurances will cover it, some won't, but it is attractive for people that say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna pay my price of depriving my testosterone, but I'd like to know that I'm gonna get back to normal when I stop. Yeah, no, that's well said. And, and again, when you talk, you know, when, when people talk and you learn, you start, your, your mind starts thinking, I, you may want to comment or not. I'm just, I'm stating something obvious. If I had a dime for the number of men that went into hormone therapy that did not know their testosterone as a baseline, that did not know what their number was before it was about to go to zero, I'd have a lot of dimes. Mm -hmm. And the reason I find that to be a tragedy is because you want to, you would, I would think that you, Dr. Souls, would want to know what their number was before treatment, because you're going to be optimistic that one day the person is going to come off treatment. And you know, what was normal for that person a few years ago, you want to know that, right? And the other reason I've always thought that you want to know that is because if your testosterone is already super low before you start androgen deprivation therapy, there's not much room for it to go very far. And that might be clinically significant, right? So I don't know if you wanted to comment on that. I, I, another thing I, I did definitely learn is that you were, pe people knew their testosterone's going into treatment, right? Mm -hmm. they, they didn't yep. just go, they, they didn't just wait to get their testosterone number after their treatment was over. They knew what it was going into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You want to get a baseline because if, if the most efficacious treatment is to remove testosterone, if you don't have much testosterone to remove, then our expectations for the efficacy of the treatment are greatly diminished. So that's been right. shown in a lot of a lot of different trials. That's right. But I don't want to devolve because I always talk about prostate cancer. I want to hear your thoughts about Dr. Uh, Miner and uh, his, uh, you know, his what he was bringing in terms of uh, men's health apart from the prostate cancer stuff. I mean. I, uh, I think I put it here somewhere, his, his, his conclusions, but I can basically tell you what they were. He, he is so interesting because he's been at Brown for a long time in family practice, and he was always passionate about men's health. And when he started this clinic, you know, a lot of people kind of rolled their eyes, like, how is this possibly sustainable? You know, how men are going to come. But, you know, he's now become this legitimate source. He's on a lot of guideline committees. And so what he just gave us was, a, was an overview. And basically, I'm going to try to summarize his talk, and then we can talk about the, part, the latter portion of it, is he, is he was spending a lot of time saying, look, we do need to wake up as men and realize that apart from everything else, cardiovascular disease is our highest chance of dying young of any cause. And, it, and what he's trying to say is it's not downplaying cancer. It's trying to show you the nexus, the connection that when we tell you to control your blood sugar, when we tell you to control your blood pressure, we tell you to control your blood cholesterol or try to lose some weight or some waste, all these things help you in the area of cardiovascular risk reduction and might be the key to reducing your risk of prostate cancer coming back after treatment. They're all the exact same thing. So he spent a large ton of time talking about that, which I thought was very important. He also spent a large amount of his time talking about something that I know is near and dear to your heart. And where we're going to take this after this meeting will be very interesting. He talked about the game-changing weight loss drugs that are now starting to emerge. Thank now, God. You, yeah, if, I, if we didn't address that, that's the elephant in the living room. That's the this elephant is, in the living this room. Is, this is like, um, this is such a big breakthrough. It, uh, it Continue, continue. Well, what I want to say is that this was a Moyed was wrong and I was glad to be wrong. And what I mean by that is I was convinced that I would personally and you personally would never see the day that there was actually an efficacious weight loss drug. In fact, what I always said is I can sort of summarize the history of weight loss drugs in the United States. And it's, and it's well, for people watching out there in YouTube land is the history of weight loss drugs is just loaded, loaded with debris all over the highway. And the reason is, is that it caused cardiovascular toxicity. It would work by cranking up your heart rate, 
cranking up your blood pressure. And then what that did was it stimulated metabolism and you lost weight, but it was detrimental to your body long-term and wreaked havoc. That's why they were all pulled for the most part. Go look yep. at the history of Meridia or Cybutramine. These were, I remember traveling to Singapore. I remember traveling to Thailand for lectures and the drugs were everywhere and people were using them, but they were causing all this cardiovascular toxicity. So they got removed. So the, my, my best analogy for Dr. Minor was this. If you don't understand what I'm saying about the first 25 years of my career, what I was basically trying to say is your doctor is kind of looking at you going, I've got a great solution for weight loss. Are you ready? Here, have a pack of cigarettes. In other words, <laughs> when you smoke, people lose weight. One of the biggest yep. problems when smoking cessation is people immediately gain 10 to 20 pounds. And yep. smoking cranks up your blood pressure. It cranks up your heart rate. It does all the things those stimulant drugs were doing that cause problems. So yep. what I'm trying to say, it was so bad out there. It was almost as if we were saying, if you want to lose weight, why don't you smoke? And so I never thought we would reach the day where something would not have those effects and instead would, ca would cause you to curb your appetite and essentially would be heart healthy and help you lose weight in general. I mean, we're gonna probably find some catches, but did the opposite, had none of those stimulant effects, but helped you lose weight and also changed your numbers and reduced your risk of a heart attack, reduced your risk of a stroke, reduced your risk of getting diabetes or took you out of diabetes. And so what we have is this new line of class of drugs. They're called mm -hmm. GLP-1 agonists. And the first one that's out is called Wegovy, W-E-G-O-V-Y. I'm going to try to show you what I showed him. And um, this was what I showed. I said, it's also known as semaglutide. And we're now using it in doctor meetings. We're calling it a game changer. And there's another one coming out there that's, uh, that plays along in the same class, but also has a dual action. But these are these GLP-1s. And so essentially is they can have some initial gastrointestinal side effects, but the reality is people are losing in these clinical trials. It's not unusual to lose anywhere from 10 to 20% of your body weight in six to 12 months. But what I was, what Minor was saying is true. Do you realize for many people, that's the equivalent of bariatric surgery. That's, the, awesome. that's what, that's incredible, right? And, and people say, well, but here's the catch they're way too expensive. They're embarrassingly expensive, the, the, the new indications. Two, they're almost impossible to get because everybody wants it. So now they're having a manufacturing issue. Um, so that's a problem. But three, people don't realize they've been out there in another, in another form at lower dosages treating type two diabetes. And you know them because you've seen it. One is called yep. Rebelsis, which is a tablet. Which, and the other one that's in a lower dosage is called Ozembic. You probably know those signs. You probably know those songs. There's all these pharma songs out there that make me half wacky. They're so, they're, oh, I just, I don't even want to comment on how much they, they I'm not even going to go there. I'm going to stay PC on this. So Ozembic, those are, that's the same compound, but it's, it's in a lower dose, semaglutide. Mm -hmm. so, so to tell the audience out there is that Dr. Scholes always sends me these moments of observation. And, he's, and I want you to comment on this because you were one of the first to send it. And we've had these exchanges for 15 years. He mm -hmm. said in an email, he said, hey, he said, hey, Marcos. And he said, um, I have had somebody on one of these meds losing a lot of weight. What do you think? And I mm -hmm. said, oh, my gosh, he's starting to see it in his practice. Can you talk about that for a second? Well, uh, we have quite a well-heeled, as you mentioned, these things are a little pricey, uh, but yeah. we have a lot of well-to-do clients. And uh, I, uh, it, it's, there's two brothers, actually, and uh, I don't know who their, uh, their endocrinologist or their family physician was, but he apparently had samples of this, and they had a tight relationship. And he said, you've got to start taking this. You've been trying to lose weight for 25 years. You've never succeeded. And, uh, and so this gentleman came in uh, literally raving about this medicine. He'd lost about 20 pounds and it had been so drama free. I was just, I just don't have the same interest in eating. I just walk past the food now. I'm losing weight. I feel great and no side effects from the medicine. So that 
caught my attention and I started seeing this pattern. We've had a few more patients that have been put on uh, the Ozempic, which is uh, like you pointed out, FDA approved for adult onset diabetes being used off label as a weight loss or now on label as a weight loss medication. And uh, so it entirely appears to be the real deal that uh, we yeah. thought we were going to go to our graves with you know, this, this uh, unsolved obesity problem in the United States, perhaps the biggest healthcare problem that exists and uh, that now there might be a doorway out of that room. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's incredible. I, the only analogy I can give you is, I don't know, you remember 15, 20 years ago, even 25 years ago, we talked about cholesterol lowering drugs. Like if you can get your hands on them and they're so expensive and now they're basically all generic they're as cheap as anything. They should probably be over the counter. And then we've got all these other drugs in the class that if you can't tolerate that, there's plenty of others. And so I'm hoping that we accelerate that, that is more and more of this category. So this Wagovi or semaglutide comes from Novo Nordisk. Again, I don't work with any of these companies. It's, I think it's a company in Denmark. And then the next one, the next big player that looks like even better numbers is uh, from Eli Lilly. And then I'm just hoping that we get a ton of these players. It drives the price down or people find other innovative ways to get it, like Ozembic or Rebelsis, and they get to their goal. But the, the other thing that's interesting is we're not, it's important to tell the public that we're not talking about magic. We're not talking about you can have six large pizzas and you still gain weight. What the drug <laughs> basically, and this is what the other ones promised, that you could basically get away with a lot more. What, what the drug basically does is exactly what your patient said to you, is that you just don't have a desire to eat as much quantity. Yep. So this is like bariatric surgery. People always go to me, bariatric surgery was amazing. And I'm going, yeah, it is amazing, but in reality, it still works by the concept of people have to eat less the rest of their life. And mm -hmm. less is more. And that's how these drugs work. And so I, you don't know this, but Dr. Miner and I did this thing last year that got a ton of views from physicians. We were talking about it in the debate and we both agreed that this drug would probably be our first game changer. And so we used that word in the video. And then I woke up one day and there were thousands and thousands of healthcare professionals watching that exchange. And I was really proud of that exchange because it really has the potential to be a game changer. Well, since these videos have come out, I've been going to meetings and random people will come up to me and go, hey, uh, are you Dr. Moyet? I actually took that thing and I lost 25 pounds. I, I had a little bit of nausea. You know, I, I had some GI issues, but you know, I've tried everything. This is exactly like the story you say. I've tried everything. And you know, I'm not gonna say this publicly, but this thing is really working. Yeah. And so if you can get around the costs and around the fact that you have to stay on it long term, or maybe this can initiate something, we're entering a new realm here. I hope that the long term mm -hmm. efficacy is still there and the safety, but this feels how does this feel? I'm trying to give the analogy to you and me. This feels like uh, the, early, the early part of 2000 or 2010 when we saw all these drugs coming out for prostate cancer, right? Mm -hmm. The second yeah. generation anti androgens. Yeah. This feels the same in weight loss. This feels like we've turned a corner. And these new meds are really initially spectacular. So yeah, this is a, a perfect example. So we used to be giving a lot of chemotherapy in men that their Lupron wear and dry, but now we have Extandi, we have Zytiga, we have uh, Nubeca, we have Erlita, and our infusion centers where we gave large amounts of chemotherapy are being idle. That's a beautiful thing. It's and, a beautiful uh, thing. Yeah. All right. So um, the uh, any other final thoughts on Dr. Well, Miner? I have a couple of final thoughts uh, on Dr. Miner. No, I had a, I had a, I had a final thought on, on your presentation. Um, here, here, here's what my, here's what Miner said, because I wrote down some notes and he just said, we have to always remember that the principal cause of death, early male death still is cardiovascular disease. It's a modifiable obesity is the most modifiable risk factor and semaglutide Wagovi Ozembic, this is called a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And the, the human body makes this compound, by the way. We just don't make enough of it. And what you do is when you inject this, it's a simple injection, uh, essentially uh, this new approval is for once a week. And the average he said was 15 to 70% weight loss, which in his opinion is similar to bariatric surgery and a game changer. 
And then he moved out of that and he ended his talk on, I don't know if you want to comment on it. He, he surprised me. He, he talked about how much he loves the PDE5 inhibitors like sildenafil, Cialis, mm -hmm. and this category in terms of they're studying it now in the area of dementia. And it, you know we already know they can help with urinary function. We know its impact on sexual function. And you know we've always wondered in terms of someone having cognitive issues, would it help there? But he seems to feel as if these medications are your next three or four for one. I mean, I, I don't know, but he's been working with them a longer than most people. And he, 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 that's how he ended his talk. He ended his talk on, look, it's a, it's a heart healthy drug. And we used to think it, it made your erections better. And that was it. That's fine. Game changer there. And now we're noticing that it helps men with their urinary flow. Some men, it helps men maybe cognitively. It's now in clinical trial for mild cognitive impairment or dementia. So he's basically saying you should watch these carefully as the price comes down. As you know, going back 10, 15 years, I thought the price of these pills were so egregious. They were so ridiculous. I mean, when you're yeah, paying- very, very economical now. And the exactly. fourth thing that you mentioned is that they have a, a blood pressure lowering effect. It's That's modest, right. but, but real. And so, yeah, to get all that in, in one medication, the downsides that I see, because we prescribe a lot of uh, uh, Taldenafil, which is Cialis, uh, to, uh, for the very reasons that you've outlined, and that is, uh, the, it relaxes the sphincter between the esophagus and the tummy, so some men are getting a little acid reflux, uh, which you can compensate for, you know, no, no big dinners before you lay down, uh, take a little Pepsid or whatever. Uh, but that can be a small price to pay to get your sex life back, to stop waking up at night, to urinate so frequently. And those other benefits, which I'm not qualified to comment on, but in, anything that lowers blood pressure, you would think is going to translate into better long-term vascular health. So we've got so many yeah, wonderful new tools and um, we're, we're proliferating more conferences because we can't squeeze it all into our normal conferences. And so it's a, uh, and then when our next, uh, we're going to be doing in September, right? Before we're in we'll a couple of months, but I need to show you yeah. before we leave. I know we've already gone two hours, <laughs> but I need to show you that this has changed since the start of your lecture. Okay. Um, first, I wanted to give you at the start of your lecture, I wanted to give you a 15 yard penalty to Dr. Schultz for illegal use of too many dog slides without Moyad's permission. Everybody <laughs> at PCRI knows that I was the pioneer in putting dogs into presentations, including my own. So when I saw your own presentation, I call that copyright infringement. I'm giving you a penalty of 15 yards. And then what I decided to do was change my rankings from my best friends for life. Rank number one is Grazi, our dog. Tied with number one is Grant Hill. Number three is the PCRI staff. Number four is minor and Shoals comes in at five. You are always pushing at the five. Of course, my wife is always in kids. My wife and kids are always at the top. This is a different list. So you were here. You were here at the beginning at the talk. And then when I, heard, I saw the dog slides, you jumped to five. I'm just willing to tell you that my friendship with you grows the longer you and I talk because we had that camaraderie for two decades that now you're moving back up the ladder. So by fall, when we have our meeting, I think you're going to be giving Grant Hill and Grazi um, a, basically a run for their money. What do, you, what do you think about that? Well, I have to confess that actually, do uh, you remember a guy named Yelly Berenz? He was kind oh, enough. Yeah. I, I stole those slides from him. So, so I, I've, been, I've been uncovered as, a, as sort of a, a false dog aficionado, but they certainly you know, communicated the message that there are harmless variants of prostate cancer. So... I thought that was actually, I had never seen that communicated. Maybe he did that and I had never seen it. That was actually a brilliant way of communicating it. And um, it, it really does. I mean, it's the, the dog analogy goes a long way, doesn't it? And dogs have prostates. And uh, so it's ooh, very intuitive, very intuitive. All right, well, I'll do my best to try and, uh, so our next communication won't be uh, over video, uh, or if it is over video, we won't be talking prostates. And uh, thank you so much for making it all understandable and for uh, making it all entertaining and enjoyable. And uh, that's the Midas touch that, uh, that God gave you. And we're so grateful for that.
Uh, I think that's very sweet. And I, I look forward to seeing you in Michigan. I look forward to the fall meeting. And ladies and gentlemen, we just we just finished our first men's health conference in the history of the organization. And uh, I couldn't be happier. Grant Hill, thank you. Dr. Marty Miner, thank you. Dr. Mark Scholes, Alex, Peter, the entire staff. Thank you so much for everything. Again, I couldn't be happier with the first annual men's health, blah, blah, blah. We have no official title for it. So whatever you want to call, call it, it was our first time we've done a men's health conference. And there it is for you. Thank you, Dr. Scholz, and thank you, Dr. Moya. That was an incredible way to wrap up our first men's health conference. Also, a big thank you to Dr. Marty Miner and a big thank you to Mr. Grant Hill. We appreciate them spending time with us and sharing their information. And also, a huge thank you to my PCRI team. Without them, we would not be able to produce any of this content. If you would like more information about PCRI, you can visit our website, which is in the description. The link is right there, and you can go and click and find so much information on men's health and prostate cancer. So I know a lot of you have been wondering what we're going to do this September, whether it's in person and virtual. Well, first of all, all of our conferences will always be virtual. We don't want to exclude anybody on a global scale getting access to this information. So virtual will absolutely happen. Our next in-person conference, as Dr. Mark Moyad said, will now be in March of 2023. Uh, this September, we just wanna make sure that we're staying absolutely safe. There's a lot coming out in regards to COVID and we wanna make sure that our safety protocols are in check. So as much as I'd love to see you in this September, we will see you in 2023 in person. But the virtual conference is coming. We have an incredible lineup and I know it will help you in your health. Again, if you would like more information about prostate cancer, also subscribe to our YouTube channel. We come out with new prostate cancer videos every single week and even hit the bell notification icon. That little bell basically will give you a notification to your phone to let you know when we come out with new videos. Also, if you would like to donate to PCRI, you can go ahead and visit pcri.org forward slash donate. One of the things that we do is we produce videos, but there's all sorts of things that we do in PCRI to support the prostate cancer community. And if you would like to be a part of that, that's a good way to do so. I hope you have a great week. Thank you so much again for letting us serve you and trusting us for your uh, information and education. We hope you have a great day. Provench is an established cellular immunotherapy used to treat certain men with advanced prostate cancer. Provenge is customized to each individual and is made from his own immune cells. Immunotherapy is the prevention or treatment of disease with substances that may stimulate an immune response. The immune system has memory and can recognize substances it has encountered previously. Immunotherapy is designed to boost the immune system to target and attack advanced prostate cancer. This is why immunotherapy empowers the immune system to fight the cancer immediately and allow the effects to last over time. Indication. Provenge is a prescription medication used to treat certain men with advanced prostate cancer. Provenge is an established cellular immunotherapy and is customized to each individual by using his own immune cells. Important safety information. Before receiving Provenge, tell your doctor about any medical conditions, including heart or lung problems, or if you have had a stroke. Tell your doctor about any medicines you take, including prescription and non-prescription drugs, vitamins, or dietary supplements. The most common side effects of Provenge include chills, fatigue, fever, back pain, nausea, joint ache, and headache. These are not all the possible side effects of Provenge treatment. Provenge is made from your own immune cells, which are collected during a process called leukapheresis. The cells are processed, returned, and then infused back into the patient through an IV, intravenous infusion, approximately three days later. This process is completed in three cycles, about two weeks apart. Each infusion takes approximately one hour and requires 30 minutes of post-infusion monitoring. Provenge infusion can cause serious reactions. Tell your doctor right away if you have signs of a heart attack or lung problems, such as trouble breathing, chest pains, racing or irregular heartbeats, high or low blood pressure, dizziness, fainting, 
nausea, or vomiting, have signs of a stroke, such as numbness or weakness on one side of the body, decreased vision in one eye, or difficulty speaking, develop symptoms of thrombosis, which may include pain and or swelling of an arm or leg with warmth over the affected area, discoloration of an arm or leg, shortness of breath, chest pain that worsens on deep breathing, have signs of infection, such as fever over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, redness or pain at the infusion or collection sites. Tell your doctor about any side effects that concerns you or does not go away. For more information, talk with your doctor. You are encouraged to report negative side effects of prescription drugs to the FDA. Visit www.fda.gov medwatch or call 1-800-FDA-1088. Please see accompanying full prescribing information. Prostate Cancer Research Institute is an educational organization for prostate cancer patients, their caregivers, and their families. We put patients first and are an unbiased source of information and support. For over 20 years, our goal has been to meet the educational needs of prostate cancer patients at every stage of their journey. Medical technology is advancing rapidly and new treatments are becoming available. Patients have to make complex choices which have lasting implications. They face unexpected industry biases and doctors who may not be up to date on the latest research. Your donation helps men receive the latest, most up-to-date information, which empowers them to make informed decisions. Our website, PCRI.org, is a wealth of information and resources. Our conferences and webinars are a way to get patients questions answered by leading physicians and researchers. And we have a helpline for men to call with questions about their diagnosis, treatment choices, and side effects associated with these treatments. Each week we produce multiple videos covering concepts and every patient question that we can think of about the disease in a straightforward and easy to understand format. This was a brief overview of what we do at PCRI, and to learn more you can visit our website. Your donation directly funds our educational programs, which give life-changing information to men during a very vulnerable time in their life, and we thank you for your consideration. You can visit PCRI.org to learn more.